Hear ye, hear ye. The Parliament of Geek shall now come to order. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Parliament of Geeks. The place where we answer one simple question. Be it weeb or be it scrub. And as always, as we do here, good brothers and sisters, honored, honored members of the Parliament, it is time to rise for our drinking anthem. School! School! Cheers, motherfuckers! Oh. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to sell the yellow horn! And less, ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when I have the house all to myself and I have to worry about <laughs> blowing anyone else's eardrums out. <laughs> no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Eardrums grow back. Mop. <laughs> Mop. Mop. <laughs> <laughs> Maddie, if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it right. No, no. It's it's literally Archer, like like mop, mop. <laughs> All mop. right, fa fair enough. I get fair enough. I got my references cross wired. Just remember, that, you know, across the streams. Uh, it, it, that and you know, you're, you're you're not on your regular setup, so you you always come discombobulated. It can happen. It's happened to mm -hmm. both the best of us. Yeah, um, which is why it happens to us because we are close to the best. Um, but we are back once again with the Parliament. I am having because of a bit of computer issues. I am recording this on my laptop instead of my regular setup uh, because I did not want to do it a week later. And to to quote to quote a certain bully, we'll do it live. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think do I have that button set up. Yes, I do. We'll do it live. Fuck it. Damn, that's an old one. <laughs> hey, old jokes don't die. Old jokes don't die. They just adapt to the times. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah. So, it's. I would like to open. I would like to open this up by talking a little bit about the about the a genre of games that I think all of us are familiar with, but do not heavily engage in for for various reasons. And that is the multiplayer online battle arena, also known as MOBA. Now, the whole thing start the whole thing started with defensive with defense of the ancients, which is probably the most popular mod of War of Warcraft three, which is saying something given the rabbit hole of the modding community within that within that game, or rather, the modding community that was active within that game. Thanks, Blizzard. Uh, I, I remember I, the infinite amount of Dragon Ball Z gain experience and learn to Kamehameha clones that were in Warcraft Three. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my friends yeah. never stopped playing them. And much like much like Factorio mods, if we were to go into some of the Warcraft Three mods, um, we're not coming back. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the end of us. But I do want to say that Dota actually pretty much, I, even if it didn't spawn these, it definitely popularized not only MOBAs, but another genre altogether in the tower defense genre. Yes. And defensive use of, of RTS is, cer is certainly nothing new, but some of the people involved with that would later go, would later go on to found, go on to found Riot, which created League, which created League of Legends. And you can still see some of that Warcraft DNA, both in a lot of the early designs for here, for heroes and some later designs, if I'm being honest, as well as the story bits that they littered throughout the place. Like a lot, a lot of it does isn't too far off from the hodgepodge of it, of, insp of inspiration kind of story snippets that are seen throughout Rune Tip. They're seen throughout um, Azeroth. Hell, just look at the main map that they use. Like, you can't tell me that doesn't scream Warcraft 3 in its design. Mm-hmm. 
Now, being a, being a fan of Warcraft three as as I am, one with one with, and even to to an extent, the defense of the Ancients mod, one would think that I would have jumped on, have jumped on, and got and gotten in bed with the with the with with um dot with stuff with something like League. And while I did try it out, there were a few. I have a very love-hate relationship with League, and it's only gotten worse with time. Now, I do want... I am going to... I'm not going to delve too deep into this. This is only this is only to set a bit of a stage. Because there's a lot of things setting-wise setting when it comes to the characters that I enjoy with, 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 the, with the setting of League, Runeterra. What I did not care for is the is the fact that the em, the emphasis on a team play game without without much in the way of team building mechanics is exactly what creates the toxicity that that the game has been infamous for. Overwatch has this exact same problem where they where they don't have a team they don't have a team based queue for a team based game. And the game modes that they have rely heavily on co- on coordinated efforts. And I'm supposed to be surprised that you end up creating toxicity when you have that level of high riskness, especially with the ranking system that both games have. The other major issue is very little opportunity to fight with to fight just using bots, so you can at least practice in a um, controlled environment. Yeah, if you're if you're just starting out with League, good fucking luck. You're just getting thrown right into the fire. You get one you you get one bot match that's the glorified tutorial, but it's the bad kind of tutorials. Where it teach the kind of tutorial that teaches you the basic controls, but doesn't teach you how to put that how to really put that into practice. I, Especially with all the different types of ways you can play. I mean you have Five different types of players that you could to, to, to you could play as, and you have no idea how any of it works. It doesn't. It doesn't teach you what AD carry is. It doesn't teach you what jungling is. It doesn't teach you what tanking is. It just teaches you the basic controls and how to win a match. And let's uh, not forget the fact that while there are five roles as defined by players, there are six roles as defined by Riot. <clears throat> Which does Long exactly story mean. short, here's how you how he, here's here are the bronze you press. Good luck, fucker. I yeah. liken it to the to the quote unquote tutorial that you see in the demo ver- the demo version of a game where it just shows you that one screen and then throws you in the middle of it, which Penny Arcade made fun of years ago. More things change, the more they stay the same, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. We usually call this the swim damn it problem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the um. I can swim. One more. One arm or the other. Come, come on, Christopher. Go help your brother. But the uh, the the biggest issue with the way the tutorial works in League is <clears throat> there is a way to build your characters with the gold that you get from you know farming the mobs and everything, mm-hmm. and. Oh, minions, excuse me. I know someone's going to get on my case for that. Um, Fuck them. I know. I just... Accuracy, Monk. It's not for them. It's for me. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the uh, that That's actually probably the most pitfall area of the game possible. One that could use its own fucking tutorial. Because... Frankly, there are choices that are fucking traps. Monk and I hate choices that are nothing but traps. Mm-hmm. And uh, that shouldn't be the case. <sighs> yeah, that's it's for that it's for that reason that I that I have made I have made very cl- I made very clear. That the the that if you want if if you want if you want to get people into into the thing and actually play, you can you have to introduce them properly. I'm not, and I some people say that that's handholding. It isn't. 
while while we do not con- while we do not condone hand holding, we also do not condone hand breaking. Yeah, it honestly, it's very simple fucking solution. If you if you can't you know if you can't just have a little screen pop up with a link with links to YouTube videos explaining what all the different roles are, some rec some recommended starting heroes to, for those roles, and showing you how to use them. To 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 an acceptable level, you know, you don't have to teach them how to be fucking pros. We don't expect you to teach them how to go right into worlds, but at least show them how the role works, what it's meant for, and some starting heroes to give you an idea of what kind of what kind of characters, what kind of heroes you can use for that particular role. It's not that fucking hard. Mm-hmm. I still think a dedicated tutorial to which items are best for what are going to be invaluable, but we'll never get those unless you go onto YouTube as well. And I don't like the idea of you of utilizing u- utilizing um, other people make other people making guide videos as a solution because it is yeah that's why I'm saying you should make like dedicate like official tutorial videos because having a whole tutorial in game might be a little much but have a link to an official guide on YouTube by Riot that would work. The closest that they do is do is doing a demonstration video regarding the abilities of a hero, but even but that doesn't tell you all that much. It's it, oh. like it's like doing that if there's a, if there's any game that if there's any genre of games that's actually gotten the way to do a tutorial proper in recent years, it's been fighting games, especially Arxis's work. I mean, you have you have command tutorials, but Arxis has gone out of the way to demonstrate the the kind of playstyle that each character is going to have. Um, I really started seeing that with the work that they were doing for Blaze Blue. Now, I, and that's why Arxis has given such love. Mm-hmm. Now, I bring all of this up because one to make clear that. There is no le- There is no. There is with the stuff that we're going to be talking about. There is no League of Legends bias that we have. In fact, I'd, I'd say a good chunk of us are frustrated over the fact that you have this very fascinating world that, until recent years, has been, has been constrained through e- through either the kind through transmedia that pe- that less people are going to be able to engage in because it's either sh- it's either short stories or something like that, or or wi- or wiki entries, or it, or it's so, or it's only through the lens of one game, and in the last few years, this has been a ad- riot has been trying to address this by dipping into other games. Now, Valorant doesn't count for the sake of this; that's its own thing, and I'm not a big fan of Valorant because of the playstyle isn't my style. That and it's, that and it's a game at war with itself, but. You have the Ruined King, which is an, which is an RPG. You have um, Hextech Mayhem, which is a which which is a platformer, and then you have the then you have the project that we're talking about today, a Netflix animated series known as Arcane. Yeah, the whole idea behind Arcane was basically. Even if you have never played League in your life, but you want to understand what the world world of Runeterra is like, this should be this should be a good starting point. But you want to know, you want to know what the closest thing to dip to dipping into this was beforehand. One mo, one roll twenty module about Bilgewater. The five E Runeterra module was done by fans. <laughs> um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When Zan can't even think of a, of a, of a funny way to, t- to tell you, okay, this is sad. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And by the way, for the record, for the let the record show, gentlemen, that there are some members who've probably played the game, but I haven't. For sure, Shades hasn't. And- yeah, no, the only thing I've done, though I have watched my fair share of videos, I've watched plenty of stuff from Worlds, and I don't just be opening ceremonies with those awesome songs, trust me. I've watched some actual <laughs> little uh, pro matches, and that does not teach you how to play the game. Good luck keeping up with that madness. 
Mm-hmm. They they man they uh I, I think the part that again the, the part that I keep harping on the buying of the items they um they actually maneuver those menus so quickly they're on screen for less than ten seconds. Yeah, it's you you can't learn top level uh gear strats watching pros. There's not enough time. And. With that in mind, the as as far as as far as I'm cons- as far as I'm concerned, with the judgment point for some for an adaptation like this, and this is something I've said about other get other game to to animation or film, what have you, works is that you should not need a degree of foreknowledge in order to enjoy a work. It should be able to stand on its own. If it can't stand on its own to, in its storytelling, then it fails. This is the. It's for this. Re, it's for this reason that there's a there's very few. Whether it be whether it be Western or Eastern animation, or even, and especially with film, there are very few adaptations from video games that have actually stood up on their own. I know some people might want to want to bring uh, bring up stuff like stuff like Sonic the Sonic the Hedgehog movies, or or stuff like um, stuff like Gungrave, but how how many others can you think of? Even the King, even the King of Fighters movies that um, Obari was a fa- was a part of are more fan ser- are more fan service for people who played the ga- the games than something that holds on its own. And honestly, with the Sonic, with the more recent Sonic the Hedgehog movies, you don't need to have knowledge of the games. I mean, they're so what it's so you it's so well known that very few don't have knowledge of it. But you don't even if you do, even if you have no knowledge of who the hell Sonic the Hedgehog is, the first movie is an origin story essentially. It sets up everything you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now with. And because of that, I feel that I feel that act, that actually having some, having some people who are familiar with the game and some people who aren't is going is going to be is going to be important for exact for examining this because we have a, a variety of perspectives. And with that with that said, I think I think it's high time we really start we really start diving into. Um, arcane and before but before we get into the sto- the um, story itself i I'd, l- I'd like to I'd like to talk a, a bit about the visuals that we have because holy fucking shit did they nail the the visual identity yeah with League of Legends if there's one thing you can say about it in its favor is that it has a very distinct art style even given the fact that it is like even in its video game form it has a very distinct art style despite its you know connections to Warcraft 3 it still does a lot to stand on its own and later additions to League have definitely really emphasized that I mean you look at a lot of the music videos that have come out over the years it definitely creates a very unique look and Arcane they got the right people to mimic that design holy shit this is you see something from Arcane, you can tell it's something very different. Uh, it's Forte very Shea atmospheric. Hmm. Fortiche Productions was the company that helped Riot put this together. And uh, let, let, let me go ahead and take a quick look at their backlog and what else they've done. Because they, they've got some good stuff for them. In fact, actually, no, Fortiche Productions has done a lot of the music videos for League of Legends. So, you know, including pretty much uh, the, one of the most popular songs they ever did, which was Pop Stars. Mm-hmm. Which is unironically an actually really good fucking uh, music video and a good song, as overplayed as it may have gotten at the time it came out. Yeah. So to have the company that made that working on a full animated series, I'd say that's a smart call. I would say so too. 
Yeah. The um, the the other thing is that while the visual identity of League, some people may argue, is disjointed because of the different areas the characters come from. Um, guys, look at the real world. Yeah. <laughs> Compare um. different regions of the world and the way their aesthetics look. The only reason it looks disjointed is because you've got all these people being summoned to Summoner's Rift to fight together as part of the League of Legends. Um, the when they're champ when they are champions, but the regions of the world they actually come from are what are explored visually and through the story in this in this in this uh, show, and that. There is a cohesiveness. You can mm -hmm. see the cohesiveness. You can even see, I think, the best part of the visual storytelling of Arcane and, and, and of the best way that they nailed the visual aspect is the transition from Piltover to Zaun. You can see it on those big shots of the bridges or from the shots inside Victor's little hidey hole or anything like that. You can see the shining beacon of progress and the slow progression downward to the Undercity. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you, you have a visual representation of that, of that transition, and it is, I wouldn't say seamless. There is going to be a seam in the transition from something that is uh, – affluent to something that is not that's that's actually the yeah. nature of, the, of that sort of reality mm -hmm. but the transition is effective and it's it should it's showing a seam where the, when they show seams you know there's there there's a reason for that scene but yes. if there's no need for it they try to mask it yeah mm -hmm. and they do well at that too and it was to the point where it's it's very hard to tell whether or not you're looking at more traditional styles of animation or you're looking at you're looking at CG because it doesn't look the way people would assume CG animation to look. Yeah, well, it's got a very I guess I, I, I don't there's like a mix of different styles there. There's kind of a chalky watercolor look to it, mm -hmm. but it's got this gruffness to it as well that like just like a rock rocky design yeah Maybe i'd describe it i'd say I'd, I'd actually say it's a it's a smoother version of what um into the spider verse was trying to do yeah well but I think and, i'm talking about the overall aesthetic like mm -hmm. the, the characters and everything there's this kind of especially with what with the main villain which we'll get to later he's got he, he looks like he was literally chiseled out of rock mm -hmm. and, and and that's also a lot of those people from the uh the undercity they're they're they've got a rougher more um more blocky exterior due almost a visual representation of how hard their lives have been i mean even jace who was a commoner for a long time still lived in piltover you you can take his square chin and manly physique because he's meant to be the, the hero like it, it, legitimately that's the boy hero archetype mm -hmm. um oh, yeah and you sit, you set him side by side with someone of the same build, Vander. Their faces are carved entirely different. Their bodies are carved entirely different, and but it still fits. Given what given what we ended up bitching about the last time we covered a Netflix um, series, I think we need to. I think we also need to talk about the auditory identity. Which to the original episode of the Parliament, and we were vi we were very one thing that we were critical of Vox Machina of was the lack of an auditory identity. Also, I got to correct you. You said that was a Netflix series. That was an Amazon series. Yeah, my 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 apologies. Streaming series. It's a streaming series. Yeah. we can leave it. it, it we can leave it at streaming still, for sure. The point still stands, but mm -hmm. I, yeah, you know. You, you know people will bitch in the comment section like they did last time we brought up Vox Machina. Yeah. <laughs> and in fairness, we, we I, I know it was brought up as more of a nitpick than anything else, mm -hmm. but it, it stands to reason that it needs to be brought up because, because you, you look at, at Arcane, the music, the atmosphere, the music enhances the atmosphere, mm -hmm. no matter the scene. 
and the music has a definitive identity. But I'd like to say this. It's not a surprise, considering as much as I hate League, as much as I hated playing it for the small amount of time I did, um, and it's sometimes god-awful community, Mm -hmm. um, Riot has never been bad at sound design. Mm -hmm. No. And we pointed out those music videos earlier and all the world's openings. And (laughs) so... Arcane having a definitive audio identity that is also a goddamn banger of a soundtrack um, was not a surprise. But goddamn, did they have to pump it to 12? This went (laughs) beyond 11. Yeah. He's not wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Like, take away the main, like, just the background music, which Mm -hmm. is really good. But you just look at, like, the main official soundtrack with like licensed artists mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when you've got guys like uh fantastic Neg- negrito sting ray chen wood kid b miller and fucking imagine dragons and i'm gonna go i'm gonna be one of those guys that actually defends imagine dragons they're not as bad as people make them out to be their they're, early they're like- stuff was certainly not was certainly not good but i think i think with working with riot they have been do they've been doing much better I also and, I also think that uh, too many people um, treat them like other people treated uh, Nickelback in the early two thousands. Because having listened to Nickelback in the early two thousands, uh, you got it reversed. It's the later shit that's bad. The earlier yeah. stuff from Nickelback. No, no. But that's when you go back. People in the early two thousands treated Nickelback like a shit band that you wanted to give the Nickelback on. <laughs> Uh, type joke all the way back that far because it was overplayed, not because it was bad. And that that mm-hmm. was the big issue. It was overplayed. Yeah, a I mean, lot of radio play. But, oh yeah, and, and that's where a lot of the hate for Imagine Dragons comes from is because they are getting overplayed to death on a lot of radio stations. One of the many many reasons why I don't listen to traditional radio anymore. I have Spotify. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but point being, Imagine Dragons is not a, a bad band. They are really good and. Their their OP for Arcane Enemy is an absolute banger of a track and perfectly fits with the whole motif of the series. It's... Not to mention their self inserts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that little. It's really a scene where they have this. They have a. They have a a CG version of Imagine Dragons playing in the bar in Zon. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, so a lot of people go, why are we comparing this to, to, to Vox Machina? It's like it's apples and oranges in a lot of senses. But I came to a realization to this. And it's more of a thought. Their realization is it's poor choice of words. It's me, boys. Mm-hmm. But Vox Machina was, uh, was an animated series on a budget, a, a very healthy budget, mm-hmm. but a budget no less. Mm-hmm. Arcane is on a budget, but oh god, the budget is so goddamn big we can afford everything we want. Yeah, yeah. like Vox Machina, and they show it much, off. Vox Machina was mo- was majority funded by Kickstarter, mm-hmm. a very healthy Kickstarter over over eleven million dollars. But yeah. when you consider how much it costs to actually make a full series. They still had to have Amazon probably fund whatever was left just to fill in what they got. They yeah. didn't have the... I'm willing to bet Arcane probably had five to ten times the budget Vox Machina had. And I mean, ten it was involved in probably even higher. were used as effectively as possible, except Netflix kicked in the money and it shows. And again, this is not a knock. This is more nitpicking. And again, going back to the soundtrack, it's atmospheric. You feel the atmosphere through sight and sound in almost every scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The I fact that, the- like, I'm looking at this right now. The original score, the non-licensed tracks, the stuff, the background noise, the background music you hear. Yeah. They have over three, like, let's see, 29? They have over, I'd say, set almost 80 songs. Of just atmospheric background tracks, yeah. Yeah, Sounds about just right. atmospheres, background tracks. That- and uh, 
I think that we we always stated that the issue with Vox Machina is there's no uh, auditory identity and thus the impact that should be felt by having a soundtrack wasn't there. Mm-hmm. So the vocal it, talent carries the carries the show. It, 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 invariably, that is that was the intention. Here, the intention is it maybe uh, is it necessarily just on the talent, but it's in the atmosphere. It's in what you it's. Well, let's let's be honest. It is a nine episode long epic cell job. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I mean, that's true. <laughs> I I think the and, best way to ex, to explain it is uh, Vox Machina, in spite of some of its uh, some of its lackluster areas, is very successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arcane is exceedingly successful. Because Riot, Netflix, everyone went all out to make what is essentially one of the biggest exhibitions of League of Legends lore ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different guess, game. Now, now, they're Vox Machina. They did a good, a good job too. But yeah. Is, you know. As tempting as it would be to bring, to bring up to bring up the budget differences, um, when it comes to this auditory identity thing, I can't. I can't. I can't write. I can't write it off as budget because, as I said in that ep- in that episode, Castlevania had this exact same problem of yeah of, of not having a musical identity. Yeah, it's a. It's more. I would say it's more of a case of they didn't quite have an idea of what kind of they did. They kind of because of how Vox Machina can feel like a generic fantasy series if you don't understand it. I get the feeling they weren't able to find a musician that could really create that identity for them because honestly they've never needed to. Like it, you know, when they do the when they do the main campaigns, they just use grab whatever music they can get away with for background music. They're like they're literally using music from like Elder Scrolls in in the game in the campaigns. But he so trying to create that identity was a lot more difficult whereas League, League of Legends already had a uh, musical identity because of all the licensed music they've had in the past and were able to reestablish that identity with what they've already created. Thus, it was a little easier for them mm-hmm. to to really dig into what they already have and just expand it. Well, and of course, uh, I think one of the best points to make here, uh, it's very clear that Riot had an idea of how Rune Terra as a world and the people within it look and feel and work. Uh, you could tell from all of the lore blurbs all over the champion profiles on the on the website, all over the, you know, all the infographics and stuff on the on just the website alone. And also with descriptions and tooltips in the actual game. There's a very distinct running theme that they have about how the world of Rune Terra works. And so they know the identity of their world and the sect and the identities of the sections of their world. So creating both a visual identity and an audio identity for a for a series was likely somewhat of a no brainer for them. They was already literally, had the foundation. Okay, how much money will this no brainer cost? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Again, again, considering Tencent owns them, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure funding is not an issue. Yeah. No, I. I was just saying, just for 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 conversational sake. Long story short, this is a this is a sh- this is a show and a production company that knew what it wanted, and it, it proceeded in pro- in producing what it wanted. And I, I do. I do think that I, that um. I could I couldn't help but notice that with some, that um. That a lot. The name that the name that keeps the name that keeps showing up for a good ch- for a good chunk is Christian Linke, and I think I think he I can't I wouldn't be surprised if I learned that he was very hands on with the production. Oh, there's likely no doubt. Riot Riot tends to be hands on with anything that has to do with with league. Mm-hmm. Um. It, it, Obviously, you know, making other games, they're definitely hands-on there. They're the ones developing. But they tended to be even hands-on with, with things like the music videos. Um, so, 
I, I don't I don't doubt that he would he would be very hands on with this with this actual production. Oh yeah. Now with that with that in mind, much like much like um, much like with our experience with Vox Machina, we can kind of split the our assessment of of um, Arcane's story into th- into three uh, into a set of arcs. In this case, th- in this case, quite literally, they re- they staggered the release in three arcs. The first arc, the first three episodes came out on November sixth last year. The second came out on the thirteenth, and the last came out on the twentieth. Which and they're even referred to as arcs on mm-hmm. the uh, on the site. Yeah, and <clears throat> the f- we the first one we got was Welcome to the Playground, which instead instead of instead of op- in is a bit of a cold open. What with it, what with a bridge it and. Kind of sets a bit, a bit of the a bit of the tone for for later events. This is a very in medias res, but we don't have all the details because we see we see what essentially was the bridge riot that that ended up ending terribly, and this is this is also where we get. We get in. We get introduced to two to two and to two characters. Um, Vi, Powder, and um, and the rest. <laughs> well, yes, but more specifically, their inevitable caretaker, because the whole point is what this scene does is show that Vi and Powder's parents, uh, they did not quite make. They it. did. Mm-hmm. They did. But so they get taken in by basically the man who would become the leader of of Zon, or at least what would become Zon. Because let's bear in mind, folks, this was still just the Undercity at the time. Mm-hmm. But Vander, who basically led the revolutionaries into this battle, and well, something he deeply regrets because he pretty much his crew got pretty much slaughtered. Yeah, yeah. war war with Piltover was a. Uh was a resounding failure. And yeah. As a as a bit of an aside, I can if I ever get if I ever got to meet any of the art directors, I would ask them if they took inspiration from the hell gas from Kill Zone when it came to the design of the enforcers. The Piltover enforcers? Yeah. Yeah, those masks definitely scream hell gas. Mm-hmm. I can definitely say it. I and see it. a lot of the enforcers have pickle hob as well. They have the the spiked helmets. Yeah, I could I could I could see either that or the or the. I would compare them to stormtroopers, but they actually hit their targets. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes they do. Other times, they don't get a chance to shoot, monk. Yeah, but the storm. But the storm. The reason the the reason the trope is called the stormtrooper principle isn't the aim thing, but rather. The whole ma- the whole mask and the uniform thing because some people mm. an argument that I've heard sometimes is what is why would why would forces use uniforms wouldn't that make them easy to spot sometimes that's the point you're sending a message to those the, the people that you want to uh, shut down saying you don't want to fuck with us. Mm-hmm. Not to mention there are other psychological benefits to controlling an army using uniforms, but that's an entirely different discussion. <laughs> we could be here all day yeah. going on that. <laughs> um, mm. Although I, I will, because of who I am, I wi- I will give I will give Vander a bit a a bit of a um, a bit of props given his weapon of choice. <laughs> I mean. Vi had to learn it from someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's shortly after that that we have that we have a bit of a time skip, and this isn't going to be the last time. Effective uses of time skips, though, mm-hmm. and uh, I think one of the things that a lot of people overlook in fiction, they like a lot of people, uh, they they demonize time skips and. I understand why. Time skips used poorly 
are ineffectual and feel like a reach. They feel contrived. Mm -hmm. The yeah, effective it, use of a time skip, it, it only enhances a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you have a point where going over every detail of their lives from a certain point just seems like a waste of time, and you need to establish that now since that moment, things have fucking changed. That is where a time skip could be very effective, and mm -hmm. we see that exact thing here. We see that the effects of that battle really hit put gave, put an impact on Vi and Powder to see what they've become as a result. Yeah, and what they and in the, and as soon as we go as soon as we go through the time skip, we see them trying to do a um hit and do a hit a. B and E, <laughs> a B a B and E a B and E run on on a on a random house in in um in Piltover, and technically a burglary, I think at that yeah. point. and um, uh, of course the of course they don't even know what the, they don't even know what they're looking for. It's just grab anything that lo that looks valuable. Grab anything, goddamn shiny. Mm -hmm. Smash and grab. Yep. Smash and grab. Um. Powder ends up grabbing something that she probably shouldn't be handling, which makes things worse. Because, as any Shadowrunner will tell you, things can all things will always get worse. Not that they can, they will. Murphy's law isn't a law for sh for Shadowrunners, or in this case, Powder. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. There's a reason she garners a certain nickname later on, which we'll get to. And. While they technically got while they technically got away and got back to got back to what's known as the lanes, they they had other troubles. It's it's honestly amazing how much this one B and E caused such a ripple effect on everything because of what it what it was that Powder ended up accidentally uh, interacting with. Yeah, and when and when that got dropped, some um, boom. Big boom. Big bada boom. Mm -hmm. It also... There were other smaller consequences that start setting up gears rolling down the hill. Um, and I use gears rolling down the hill because this ain't no working machine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, nope. The... They lose their loot. They get chewed out by Vander. Um, there's conflict amongst the people that also involves powder and her nickname mm -hmm. um and all of this is just us exploring vi and powder all of this is just episode one yeah and there is also the fact that van vander has do has done what the what the old saying about old soldiers actually do in in the in the fact that old soldiers eventually die but first they open bars <laughs> yeah. And through this you kind of have the you kind of have the implication that Vander is ba is basically the guy, the guy that keeps things together in the lanes. He's pretty much the glue holding the the lanes together because good lord if he did as we will learn once he loses that control once he uh he's out of the picture uh yeah shit falls apart fast. Mm -hmm. No, more like shit hits the fan. Multiple yeah. times, the, an the, hour. The big miss. One of the big mystery that ends up happening afterwards is who the hell gave them the bright idea to try to try and do, to try and do a B and E job in, in Piltover. Ah, uh, little echo. Mm -hmm. Which um, of and of and of course of course the and of course the the rival in this early story um Deckard who un who unfortunately does not does not have the proper coat of his namesake I don't think we'd want him to have the proper coat anyway though monk he'd probably get it stolen All things considered yeah that he'd either get it stolen or he'd get blood on it because of, because of the times he gets his ass kicked Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's shortly after that he ends up that Deckard ends up meeting up with 
a person we're going to be very familiar with, na- who's, who, his name we don't know yet, but we just know him through his presence. And the fact that he has a very, a very interesting look to, to the point where you're not going to forget, you're not going to forget his appearance when you see him. Now, like I said, this was the guy I was talking about earlier. Very much looked like he was chiseled out of rock. Well, you know, more like just dug out of rock because and he's very, very rough, very gruff. And there's that eye of his, which they never quite explain. Yeah, and it's um, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of people compare him to Harv to, to Harvey Dent. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if on a visual level there was some inspiration. But an easy way to stand out is to have a bit of asymmetry in your in a character's design. There's also a detail that I think we do need to bring up regarding that eye of his, other mm-hmm. than the way it looks. The very first thing we're introduced to him doing is using some sort of hypodermic to poke a hole in it. Yeah. To make it drain a pink fluid of some sort. Which and we'll definitely be getting too soon. Yep, in, including it, including a te- including a test. That's a bit of a bit of a horror show where they where where they decide to put a put a rat versus a cat, but give the rat a bit of a boost in the form of a mutagen known as Shimmer. And um, you would think, oh, cat, a cat versus a rat, the cat would usually win, right? Not this time. Yeah. <laughs> Not if you turn the rat into Braun freaking Strowman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or Andre the Giant. And some sort of giant thing that fucks up little or things. Or to use an in game or an in-game in-universe um example, Gragas. Yeah. See, that's why you're here. <laughs> but that, but that's how that's how we so how we start how we start setting the stage in a in a sense. And but then but then we get a different in medias rest beginning for episode two. We essentially with episode two, and this is going to be a theme for the rest of the rest of the show. We have a diff, We have a different. We have the same events that happened in episode one, just with a different set of perspectives. <clears throat> At least from the point of the robbery itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now we see who it was they robbed and the implications of what that robbery ended up costing that person. Mm-hmm. Because this is where we get introduced to Jace, who was the one who was making those crystals, which is and he- not looked upon fondly. Mm-hmm. For good reason, and, though. At least at first. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, basically, we're quickly introduced to why, what the, like, I don't, was it in this episode they introduced his backstory? A bit. Yes. Okay, then, uh, then I can go into this. So basically, when he was a child, his mother was attacked and was pretty much bordering on death's door. When a mysterious mage appeared and using magic teleported them to safety. But that use of teleportation, that use of of magic, put a twinkle in the boy's eye. Mm-hmm. And he has decided to dedicate his life to studying this magic and integrating it into technology, to the, into the technology of Piltover, to create something very new. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, oh. <laughs> I think you and I are on the same route there. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'll let you have this one. The city of Piltover, also known as the City of Progress, run by the illustrious Yordle Heimerdinger. And Yordles are a, speci- are a world-specific race. They're tiny, furry, cute things. Almost everybody knows what they look like if they've seen anything from League. Heimerdinger is old, because Yordles live a long time. Mm-hmm. Heimerdinger established the city of Piltover out of the ashes of a war with mages. And so, to him, the arcane, (laughs) the magic, is 
absolutely too dangerous to use because in the in the wrong hands of just one person it causes untold unimaginable uh heartache and destruction and you know now i've just made a linchpin moment here that i'll get to later there's there's an there's the implication that he that um it wasn't it wasn't hit it wasn't his particular kind against mages but rather mages fight mages fighting each other essentially essentially in a quasi nuclear war mm-hmm. yeah and to be, and to his to be fair to the man the fact what the devastation this this unrefined crystal had done certainly bolsters his point because just accidentally dropping this little tiny crystal that was the size of a fucking marble Kaboom. created a devastating explosion that completely destroyed Jace's home. Mm-hmm. So you can't entirely blame the man for being a little hesitant about wanting to use magic. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but rega- but regardless, because of the fact that he can't outright s- that um that he that what what we what he did was at the end of the day still illegal uh, to the point of violating what, what was it called the uh the academy mm-hmm. no the there was a very the the ethos mm-hmm. to violating oh, the ethos yeah, 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 their yeah, set yeah. their set of uh, of laws it violates the ethos anything that violates the ethos is grounds for exile and <clears throat> not only was he not only was he to be exiled but all of his research was to be destroyed now, I think it's important to note at this point that we also saw another character who didn't get a lot of characterization, but was integral to explaining a few things about how he even got into the Academy as a commoner and outsider in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is friends with one Caitlin Kierman mm-hmm. and the Kierman household, who were his sponsors in the Academy. And it's well, also because they're mm-hmm. on the seat of the council. Yeah. Yeah. As well, while Ta- while Talus's family are aren't 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 high aren't high up on the stratosphere, they um they're the they're the equivalent of the of work of a working class industrial company. If I were to make it, if I were to make the comparison to titles of nobility, the Talus family are a baronet, smallest, just above a landed knight. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas anyone on the council would be equivalent to a viscount or a duke. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no monarchy here, obviously. It's a count. It's a tech. If I'm going to be 100% uh, uh, honest here, what Piltover is is a technocracy. Yeah, yeah. They, they are run. They are run by those who are in the in the bleeding edge of their field mm-hmm. as a council. <clears throat> which can be good, depending, can also be really bad, depending. Mm-hmm. Pretty much like any particular kind of political structure. Yes. <laughs> um, but he, but because of the fact that his, essentially his life's work might be, might be, get, might be getting tossed, he contemplates, ju- he contemplates just walking off the, um, the, ed- the edge of, the edge of what was left of his, <laughs> of his lab until he gets interrupted by by someone who would be who would be a, who would become one of his closest friends that being Victor Victor was basically Heimerdinger's protege at that point mm-hmm. his basically his assistant yep and but Heimerdinger he had picked potential, him up no? Heimerdinger had picked him up from the lanes yeah. And but yet Victor saw something in Jace's research and decided, no, I'm not gonna let this one go. Mm-hmm. And this is at this at the at the same at the same time we do have we do have a bit of hostility back in the lanes because the he- because the head of um of the enforcers and her and her par- and her more hot-headed partner are get- are getting on vander to try to try and get to try and um 
get him to reveal who was responsible for the robbery and the explosion. Yeah, but it's a case of we had we had good cop bad cop whereas the main the, the head of the enforcers was actually very friendly with Vander. He's just like just just help us out here, all right? We got to mm-hmm. do we got to do something about this. We you know, he, as, as you said earlier, nice. as you said earlier before the show, the council needs its pound of flesh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to do this, but I don't have a choice at this point. Whereas her <laughs> partner was the bad cop he's just like just give us whoever did this we're gonna shut this shit down yeah we're on the other but vander is in a vander is a good man caught between the caught between a no win scenario because he has two there's two options on one hand he could he there's the question of can can i sell out my own family on the other hand the people in the lanes are chomping at the bit for him to encur- to encourage him to fight back and even accusing him of going soft. So this is the proverbial powder keg. <laughs> uh, wait. This is also ah! where a, a character who um, becomes a little more prominent later, she leaves with her little posse to go join the uh, much darker man we saw earlier. Mm-hmm. And mean and all all the meanwhile you have Silco continuing his experiments, moving on to human trials. Mm-hmm. Oh. But then then we get to the third part the third part of Act One. Where we get we get a bit of background when it comes to Vander. And the and the fact that that, that Silco and Vander were were brothers in arms when it came to fighting for the independence of Z- of Zom. But at some point, Vander ha- at some point Vander had betrayed Silco and tried to drown him. And he, tr- but he, the way Silco describes his drowning is akin to a baptism. And it's more effective than the baptism of Booker DeWitt. <laughs> we already covered that. But origin the originally Van- Vander was going to was going to turn was going to turn himself in because he couldn't he couldn't sell out he couldn't sell out his own family. But un- unfortunately, a spanner a spanner was in the works that decided to. Make things worse, because as I said before, things will always get worse. <laughs> Silco decides that, uh, no, you're not going to just make more peace. Mm-hmm. And he sends Deckard in as his, as his, as his hired muscle. And wh- while there might be superior tech when it comes to the enforcers, they didn't last long when you've got a guy who is moving around like a like a berserker and isn't feeling any pain. Yeah. And basically they hyped him up on steroids at PCP and set him loose. Mhm. Mm-hmm. It's at this point that an earlier scene where Silco threw an offer to Grayson's uh younger hot-headed partner Marcus that yeah, we can get stuff done um and I can even make you the sheriff. And uh, after slaughtering literally everybody but Marcus and Vander that was in that group, um, Marcus goes, this wasn't part of the plan. And Silco, plans change. I'm altering the deal. Pray that I don't alter it further. Yeah. And he throws him the money, which lands in the blood of Grayson, making it literal blood money. Mm-hmm. It was a that was a very effective visual visual beat. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think the only and way they could have done it better is if is if the is if the money looked like silver. <laughs> Full on Judas. Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. need the Judas effect. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Natty. <laughs> no Judas no, of no Iscariot. Iscariot. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> You set that up on purpose, Monk. I am not in. I am not in the habit of incriminating myself. <laughs> <laughs> I 
such a statement this is incriminates not a you. Law. Your, your, your silence is, is proof of guilt. I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, Kafka trapping. It's the greatest. Not. But, uh, but <laughs> this is where this, we have a we have a good old fashioned host, um, hostage situation. And a gold, good old fashioned all hell breaks loose moment. Yeah. Because Vi goes and gets her friends Milo and Klager and is like, okay, we have to save Vander. Mm -hmm. Silco took him. And Powder goes, I want to come too. And Vi is like... Before you get into that, I we should make clear the whole time Powder has had this, me this mentality of, I want to help, I'm useful, but the, pro the problem is she's a she's punching she's punching above her weight so to speak yeah to the point she's that desperate to prove herself and it, but unfortunately she's trying too hard to prove herself and mm -hmm. as yeah punching her above her weight and you're going to say Zan. to the point that there's a there's a there's the first break point where Milo and Vi earlier were talking to each other regarding powders involvement and her contributions or anti-contributions and we hear a key statement she's a jinx which and powder says, was powder was listening into that part but she didn't listen to all of it yeah vice said oh yeah she's totally a jinx but she has a bunch of different things that she can do that you can't milo but she doesn't hear that last part and uh that comes back to bite everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because even if she's a jinx, she has a natural a natural talent for put for putting together simple machinery. She's a tinker. Mm-hmm. Which for somebody with no formal training is all is always going to be impressive. Yep. But it, it's at this point when they're going to rescue Vander that uh, Vi asks Powder to stay behind because Vi is worried for her safety and thinks that this is definitely a situation where Powder would be punching far too high above her weight. Mm -hmm. But because of that conversation that, that Powder overheard, she thinks Vi's only doing it because she doesn't want Vi Powder to fuck things up. And because of that, she ends up trying to help out anyways with... Admittedly, admittedly, a admittedly a thing that was successful. That being a that being a clanging monkey little gadget that had one of the crystals because she stashed a few of them. All of the crystals. Mm -hmm. She put two <laughs> inside of it and one underneath the symbols. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a, that's more of a climax moment. Yeah. Before all that happens, mm -hmm. Vi and the gang run to go save Vander from Silco. Mm-hmm. Now, before I get before I get to the climax, I should note the parallel story because throughout the re throughout the rest of the series, you essentially have two stories being told that occasionally intertwine with each other. Mm -hmm. The other half of it is Jace and Victor trying to trying trying to get the, trying to um, get both get his get his research. Which inv which involves a bit of sneakiness and the and a very um, elaborate form of key use and, and and the whole the whole trying the whole trying to talk the guard away is which which is made all, which is made all the more complicated when Mel Medarda gets gets involved. Mm-hmm. Some someone someone on the council and someone who is going to be who is going to be important throughout throughout this, but they are they are able to they're able to get they're able to get the material and do an ex, and do an experiment that unfortunately gets some attention, but fortunately they're able to make it somewhat work, somewhat, mm -hmm. to the point that. The uh, council at least reinstates Jace in the academy mm -hmm. and allows him and Victor to work on researching this new hex tech idea he has. Mm -hmm. They were impressed. 
Weary, but impressed. Mm -hmm. But the th but just when, but at the same time, when you have this when you have this triumphant moment with with Jace and Victor, you have things getting worse down in down in the lanes because, well, for start for starters, <laughs> while they were able to rescue him, the the help managed to make things worse. Um, v Vander ends up get ended up getting wounded, and as a last ditch effort, decides to use Shimmer on himself, which does let him fight and beat the shit out of Deckard because, um, as skilled as as strong as that stuff makes him, um, the only thing worse than just strength is strength and experience. Yeah, because yeah. Decker is pretty is pretty strong under the shimmer, but Vander knows already knows how to fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although I so would like to know, we, so basically he turned Vander into the Incredible Goddamn Hulk, mm -hmm. but with a brain. Mm -hmm. So Professor Hulk, got it. Yeah, but the uh, the the other thing I'd like to notice before Powder shows up with her help, uh, while they're all trying to break. Vander out of this chair that he's literally locked into, and Milo is getting more and more frustrated and anxious as Silco starts sending cronies. And the lady we saw leave earlier, uh, Sevika, is shown in the background as well. Uh, we we have Vi taking Vander's gloves and using her training to beat down most of the of the thugs coming their way. And uh, Sevika never gets a, a real chance to fight her at this point. They mm -hmm. just send Deckard forward when she's beaten enough dudes. Mm -hmm. And then Powder's help arrives. Mm -hmm. Yep, she tries. She actually, up until now, a lot of her gadgets haven't exactly been very effective if they worked at all. Mm -hmm. This was the one time it actually worked. The one time it probably shouldn't have. Yeah. Her, e her efforts did stop Silco's crew and even blew off Sevika's arm. Um, the problem was, it, uh, well, it, uh, it took care of uh, practically everybody in, in effective range. Mm -hmm. Her two friends, Milo and Klager, uh, were Dead. killed either by the explosion or by the falling rubble. Mm -hmm. Vi was pinned under some rocks, which is why Vander had to get up and, and fight. And then we have the rest of it where Vander gets shanked by Silco and thrown off the off the side of that uh, walkway. In a, a, in a way that was meant to be a deliberate callback to when, to um, the t to their incident in the river. Mm-hmm. Because it was Vander who drowned Silco. Mm-hmm. As this revealed at this time. Yeah. Um, I think the way that they were setting it up, there was the implication that the reason for his betrayal was that was again that whole. That whole pound of flesh thing. Because mm. there, there, this is where we re, this is where we really start to get that perspective of the two of, of the two of them were were up, were on the same side, but he views he views Vander as a sellout. But oddly enough, you would think that he would hate um, Vander for what hap for what happened to him. And yet, the way he says, the way he speaks, he doesn't. He outright, sa he outright says that he doesn't hate him. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, of course, how much of that is actually is actually the case is up for interpretation, obviously. But he seemed, but he. Throughout it is is still very much a zealot for his cause. He's he views Vander as less as less as a 
hated enemy to avenge himself on and more of a disappointment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in a way, an obstacle to his goal. Mm -hmm. And at the same... But like we like we said, the whole the whole th the whole thing with the explosions makes things worse. And Vi has her moment of snapping at her at her sister. Yeah, after because, Vander saves them both. Because she she just saw she just saw everybody else get killed. Powder, who didn't know any better, um, comes in and is like, "Hey, hey, Vi, I did it. I'm useful." And this is where things and this is where things go south. Yeah. Is she ends she ends up hit she ends up hitting her and calling her a jinx before walking off. Keep a uh, by the way, are y'all folks who are keeping track of uh of the bad shit that's happening in powder? It's gonna get it's gonna get crazy. <laughs> Interesting choice of words there. <laughs> but, but, uh... Uh, it's at this point that <laughs> Silco and what remains of his crew shows up to check on the shimmerized Vander. Mm -hmm. Find him dead, find Powder there. And Silco's like, no, no. She's gone. She left you. Telling Powder that Vi is gone. Liar! And Vi sees this and wants to turn around and go and get her from Silco because fuck that, you can't have my sister, even if they just had a fight. And it's at this point that Marcus, both wanting to have at least something over Silco and also feeling kind of dirty after all that's happened, mm -hmm. stops her from going, says, if you go over there, they'll just kill you. And then locks her in Stillwater prison. Mm hmm. And that is, how, and the act ends. The act ends with Silco carrying Powder and and saying, "We'll show them all." Mm hmm. Then, when with, with Act Two, we get our, we get our second major time skip. In um. No, 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 with all of it centered around a a major holiday known as Progress Day, that at least to me ha very much had a vibe of the of the World's Fair events in the er, in the early twentieth century. Yeah, that's well, the I can see that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. it does look like the World's Fair, and it's also the bicentennial of the city. So, yeah, and what and. Wasn't there a, wasn't there a World's Fair event in New York in the seventies? Yep. Huh. And nineteen seventy six was the bicentennial of the United States. So there's layers to these references. My favorite kind of references. Indeed. And right away, the big thing we start to see is that a big change has occurred in Piltover, mm -hmm. as the hex tech that Jason Victor worked on has now become a big fucking deal. They created an entire commerce and travel network known as the Hex Gates. With Piltover being their hub. Which uh, they could base they could basically take a, a long ass travel and make it almost instantaneous using Hex Gates to basically launch ships to their destination. Which I I think when people are, and this is one of those things where I, where I credit the ability to world build. I think a lot of people don't take, in, don't take into account how massive implications you, of implications you can have through one change in technology. Yeah. Whereas this, um, this change is actually very, very noticeable noticed and influential mm -hmm. consider how the consider how the invention of new of um of new forms of metal created entire ages in the ancient world just the di just the difference between say bronze and iron yep 
I mean, bronze was re- bronze was reliable for its time, but you put you stack up bronze against iron, bronze is going to lose. It's far too soft. Mm-hmm. I know one might say, "How how can a metal be soft?" Believe me, it can. Believe me, it can. Gold is incredibly soft. Guys, open up any of your electronics wires. Look at the gold or silver within. That's why. It, why do you think it's so flexible? Soft metal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And bronze was a alloy based on copper and tin that was that was made at a time when pe- when people didn't ha- didn't have as good of an understanding on how to mix metals. With uh, with iron, people had a mu- people had a much better understanding, and that's just with one that's just with um, one change in material. Cons- let's cons- consider th- consider the change of consider the changes in far- in farming production when you ha- when you started to have automated tools in- enter 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 the um, life enter the lifestyle of the of the agriculture scene in different countries instead of having there, people do things by hand. There's a, there's a bigger one, Monk. There's a much, much bigger, and it's actually the comparison that we should be going for. <clears throat> Consider the industrial shift of the world when electricity became accessible. Yes. That's exactly what the, the amount of change Hextech puts on Piltover and the world of Runeterra. Because in now this 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 affects this 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 essentially essentially turns Piltover into what was probably a small but promising nation into an economic powerhouse. It's just like the U.S. I wonder where all these these uh parallels come from. And to, and to be fi- and to be fair. Um, I, as somebody, as somebody who has been tooling around with with writing Magitek in in his own settings, this is a good example. I appreciate. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because they went for the, we the biggest the, applications mm-hmm. first. Yeah, and it's, and in the process, we we learned that they have a brand new, a brand new gem a brand new gemstone device that is. Essentially, a far more refined version of the crystals that they had been using up until that point, or to put it to put it in a smart ass way, they invented materia. Yeah, basically. Uh, I, I mean, want to say you're wrong, but only on a technical level. They do look like materia. That's, there's no joke there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, but the big, the biggest change to these new refined crystals is that well they're a lot more stable (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah you can hit them with the hammer and they won't explode which is in fact what what jace does he's like watch this and heimerdinger's like oh god fuck no explosion Mm -hmm. and and then you and then shows how that shows how it can be utilized with a with the with the um, arm laser that that you that you see, as well as the, the as well as the gauntlets. The arm laser was the best part because <laughs> uh, it was it was it was clearly made as <laughs> as a reference to later things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, the fact that it accidentally zaps a part <laughs> uh, a, a part of the horn on Heimerdinger's pet. Creature that is reminiscent of a small dog. Mm-hmm. Um, was yeah. a good humor moment. Yeah, yeah, yes. But it's it's at this point that we learn that despite everything that they've done with Hex Tech, despite everything that they've achieved and all that they've shown the council, Heimerdinger's uh, obsession, and I am going to say it's an obsession with caution and safety. Um, and also the fact that Heimerdinger is of a species that lives for literal centuries rather than a human who only lives for a century at most mm-hmm. shows the differences in their viewpoints. Uh, Heimerdinger's like, oh man, all these tools will be real cool in a decade. And Victor, who is for some Dying. reason, we, ha- we don't know that yet. 
Mm-hmm. Don't skip ahead, Maddie. Well, yeah. well, yeah, some of us have to go to work in the morning. <laughs> this is true. But Victor, who is for some reason desperate, uh, is like, we don't have time for that. And so is Jace. Jace is like, but a decade's way too long. We're like, well, you'll be able to work out all the kinks and make sure it can't be misused that way. Mm-hmm. Which, man, I am just setting up domino after domino at these points. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, because I was going to say, uh, by the end of this series, uh, I'm Digger's not exactly proven wrong. On anything he said from the very beginning, but we'll get to that. He... And but the but the the difference in perspectives is what causes that kind of tension. Yes. And then, but now the the other thing that the other thing that's a bit of a shock is the fact that for the longest time the tradition has been that that, that there was going to be a big speech at pro, for Progress Day, and for the, and for as long as anybody can remember, that's been Heimerdinger's job. For the first time, he's giving it to someone else, in this case, Jace, who has, is kind of treated as the favorite son of the of of Piltover, given the fact that his that his portrait is all over the fucking place, with the literal yeah. caption of the face of progress. Mm-hmm. And the thing. The thing that makes this the, and while they do while um, while he does make the speech, he doesn't sh- he doesn't show the newfangled stuff that they ha- that they have. It's just a it's just a standard politician speech. And this is due to his misgivings of misuse, especially mm-hmm. after the part of the B plot that came up in all of this. Zilko's crew smuggling stuff into Piltover. And that, and the interruption of the firelights. Who, first off, when it comes to first off, they get po- they get points for having for having a damn good hoverboard. <laughs> oh yeah, I will always appreciate a hoverboard. That's why I had that's why I had Airblade back on the PS2. Mm-hmm. There's a deep cut for you, but the but the ju- but you know how you know how we say that sh- that shadowrunners have the worst luck possible because things always go bad. Doesn't stop. No, because while the while the firelights are able to make a very good ambush, when they go into when they go into ins- to inspect the cargo and possibly to, and possibly to burn it, there's some interesting writing all over the place, and a swing. Which is just swinging back and forth until they see the bottom of it, at, and it says, "Boom." <laughs> and that's where we real. That's where we get to see, for the first time, Jinx. I e. Hi, Harley Quinn and Joe <laughs> and Joker all combined into one crazy person. I e. <laughs> pow- I e. Powder, as as Silco's as one of Silco's right hand women. And de facto daughter mm-hmm. and while she does well while she does fit while she does get rid of the fi- get rid of the firelights and force them to retreat unfortunately there's a it's not exactly the best idea to be firing a fucking minigun on a ship no. friendly fire isn't friendly people no <laughs> especially no, when you've got I don't think scares when you've got volatile cargo so, mm-hmm. technically speaking, they did manage to get the cargo wrecked, just not the way they probably were um, should have. Yeah, but even with this, it is this is where we have we have another aspect of the visual identity with the game be- with the um, series because Vi's not all there in the head, and her hallucinations take the appearance of. These Correction, nightmares. Jinx, you said bye. Yeah, sorry, bye. What the hell am I saying? J- <laughs> See, this is the problem when you cross the streams, people. That's why we're here. This is the problem when your shows go a little too long. <laughs> you eventually make stuff up. Mm-hmm. And this, 
This is also where we get to see someone we we saw briefly early in Act 1, and that is Caitlin, who at this point is the equivalent of a beat cop. Yeah, but a, a glorified... Off for, beat for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's, she's a glorified beat cop. Um, it's very clear that while she did join the Piltover Enforcers, uh, her position as the daughter of a counselor uh, is... Even if she doesn't want it to, her mother is influencing how she's assigned to things for her safety. Mm-hmm. Overprotective and, mother. 101. And, and uh, Caitlin doesn't want that. She actually wants to solve crimes, which she does. She goes and sneaks onto this thing, takes pictures, finds evidence, even finds the guy that uh, was terribly wounded by friendly fire. Mm-hmm. Shocking. But uh, then Marcus, the now sheriff of Piltover, mm-hmm. pops up and says, hey, you're not at your assignment. Get the hell out of here. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be working night duty. Yeah. Go do it. And night, du- <laughs> and night duty ends up with a situation of things get worse because in a, me- in a move to impress Silco, Vi decides that she's going to... Jinx! 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 Jinx. God damn it. Monk. Jinx! 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 Monk, if you got to do it to blow by blow, get it right! Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jinx is such a jinx, she's even Jinx's monk... She even Jinx's monk's yeah. memory. Good lord, that's true. <laughs> she thinks this is why and, I don't, don't do blow by blow reviews anymore. Even I'm prone to that shit. Anyway... Jinx ends up ends up managing to managing to start managing to start a fire that ki- that kills five enforcers and in the chaos stealing the stealing the gemstone. At least one of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She only steals one of them, and even though we saw three of them, but one but one missing ge- one missing hex core not hex core one missing gemstone is. One gemstone lost too many. Yep. <clears throat> and this sort of chaos leads to uh, Jace cracking down on his own inventions despite Victor's protestations. Mm-hmm. Even the hex gates close. But most of all, because he's so concerned and because Heimerdinger holds him in such high uh, high regard Heimerdinger's like let's let's put him on the council to control his own invention and lo and behold now we have counselor Talist and this is where we kind of start to see the players in action now for those of you who are watching I would like to direct your attention towards my little splash screen that I made for this episode tonight when I, I put this together with a purpose. There's actually a method to my madness. And yes, there's always a lot of madness. Mm-hmm. The monk. Because it's about this point we start to see how these players fit into these roles. And the reason I have Jinx and Jace uh, as large as they are on the opposite sides is because they represent the two extremes here. And I don't just mean the fact that it's Zahn and Piltover. But when you really look at it, they represent order and chaos. Mm-hmm. And yep. it's about here you start to see that. Jace is directing things, is trying to maintain control as things are getting out of control, trying to rein in all of the madness that's going on in Piltover. And the pro- cause of that chaos is Jinx. Mm-hmm. Someone who you can, you have to really help, you have to tighten that leash hard, or else she goes hog wild and uh, does not care about casualties. Nope. <laughs> so, yeah, that's when you start to see those two extremes. We'll get to Caitlin and Vi's role and why they're stuck together in a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's in this way that I can almost think as a, a, a of. Um... 
of Jinx as the arcane equivalent of the mad dog of Shimano. <laughs> oh, God, don't do this shit again. <laughs> there you go. My Majima for the episode. Thankfully, you got cut off because you got too loud. <laughs> I'm just that good. <laughs> and you know, I swear to God, I will make references that will piss people off if we keep going with that gag. But, any, anyways, after after the after the twenty one guns, shortly after the um, after the twenty one gun salute, um. Caitlin decides to decides to investigate further because even though even though her even though her boss told her to drop to drop the case, we've seen we've seen we've seen a cop movie in our life. We know how this goes. No, you never drop the case. No, but it's also at this point that uh, Jace reveals to her, yeah, you're not a you're not a cop anymore. Mm -hmm. As of today, yeah, she could be part of my security retinue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on top of that. She was one of the ones involved there when that whole thing went down. So now for her, it's almost kind of personal. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, she is able to she is able to 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 track down the fact that the person she inte- she had spoken to previously was is holed up in not Alcat not Alcatraz or better Arkham, known as Stillwater Prison. Except here's where things get a little complicated because while while that guy is in there and it's the same guy it's the, and it's one of the tattooed guys that was in Silco's employ, there was a incident during during um meal time. And now basically, he's eating through a straw. Yeah, basically, even if he was willing to talk, he can't. <laughs> Not anymore, anyway. Not until not until you find a way to reconstruct his jaw. <laughs> I give it about six weeks and a bunch of wires. He'll be fine. And the episode ends with with um with with Caitlin meeting up with the person who did that to him, and that's where we see a a grown up Vi who is who is engaged who is engaged in boxing practice with a concrete wall. Third time's the charm, at least to use the correct name this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's my fuck up. But uh it's at this point that we have Caitlin technically engaging in vigilanteism. Mm-hmm. And well, using yeah. her authority and the authority of counselor Talis, mm-hmm. aka Jace. To get Vi out so they can go hunt down what's going on. Mm-hmm. And of of course of course this is oh this is also a means for Vi to get out and try and find powder. And it is through it is through a good chunk a good chunk of the of the of the early story in this is to s- We've seen we've seen how Piltover has changed in the last few years, especially especially with the rise of J- of Jace as the as the man of progress. Now we get to, through this. Now we get to see what the lanes have become. What be, since Silco was the one who occupied the power vacuum. And, and you lane. can imagine how that turned out because, well, he doesn't really care about keeping much order in the lanes. He 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 cares about keeping only so much order as what gets his drugs out to the people. And what what's especially a case in point is what's happened to Vander's bar, the last drop, which looks less like a bar and more like a nightclub. Yep. It's much more lively, but also much less controlled. Much less controlled. You have people. Op- you have people openly, s- up openly using sh- using shimmer as a recreational drug. Yes, let's use a mutagen that turns you into a monstrous individual as a drug. Mm-hmm. I'm sure nothing. Shimmer is a drug. 
I'm sure there's no consequences to this. Ah, look, the consequences of my actions. Yeah, I um, I can't do I can't do a good postal dude impression. <laughs> and even with and the this is also where we get to see the a bit more of the deal that Marcus has cut with um, Silco. He gets to be sheriff, while while in exchange he has to look the other way regarding shimmer shipments. Yep. And you and he's you and instead the blame for the for the hex for the hex tech robbery is on the firelights. Yep. This is also where we see. Because of the fact that Jinx doesn't want to work on the gemstone, because because she's still dealing with um, her hallucinations, Silco has the idea of taking her to the lake. Also, it should also be noted that part of the reason she doesn't want to work on that gemstone is she knows what it is, and PTSD is a bitch. Yeah. PTSD, Stockholm syndrome, a little bit of schizophrenia. She's made do she's made dolls of her of her form of her deceased friends and talks to them, and they berate her and condemn her and give her some very dark advice from time to time. Mm -hmm. So those friends are still quite alive in her head. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when Silco takes Jinx to the river, uh, it's for the same reason that he came from the river. He says that. That she needs to let powder die and be reborn. Which is successful. Sort of. Oh. Kind of. Ish. And the third the third part of this particular episode is the fact that Mel Medarda starts starts some um, making the moves on Jace. Eh. <laughs> Understatement. We had we had a brown Making chicken brown cow moment. Um, Monk, I said it on the when we were watching. I'll say it now. A friend of mine said it best. They fucking. <laughs> <laughs> usually when that, usually when that line gets brought up, it's it's implied. No, this was very like this was as, ex it's, as it's explicit. All line explicit what the as fuck explicit you're doing. as you can get without actually showing anything. Mm -hmm. But once again, we have the parallels because this is also where we reveal that Victor hasn't been doing so well in the in the years since. In fact, you yep. you can you kind of they kind of already hinted at it with his appearance. He looks a bit more. He was already kind of pale, but he looks far more pale than he did than he did in Act One. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they also hint at it with his desperation. Mm -hmm. This this is where it's revealed that he's dying, but he's also been working on a new invention. The most the most ominous looking D twenty you will ever see. Oh God! <laughs> that, that, called the Hex Core. He says he wants it to be magic that learns. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so once we're creating it's... magic AI. Real smart idea. So basically, you're turning magic into Skynet. Why does everybody always assume that AI becomes Skynet? Dude. Well, in media, it's almost inevitable. Mm-hmm. But the the intent is one of the intents is that it is that this is something that reacts and Encourages growth of organic matter. At least says after he. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. At least after he has a brain hemorrhage and bleeds on it. Ah. Uh. <laughs> but he. Tr but the, but he sees the hex core as his way out. Whereas Heimerdinger, if he was cautious about the de about the development of <coughs> of these of second generation. Um, hex tech gems. The presence of the hex core outright horrifies him. He sees that and it's like, oh no, oh yeah. this is death. This mm -hmm. is yeah. death incarnate. Th this is Heimerdinger 
thinking all the way back to the Mage Wars and going, no, magic of this type cannot be allowed to exist. And it's at this point that uh, Counselor Medarda uh, convinces, or at least ushers, presses Jace into making the decision to retire dear Counselor Heimerdinger. Mm-hmm. And, and it should also be noted at this point, Moderna has been teaching Talos the ways of being a counselor, including uh, making those nice backhanded deals to basically wet the palms of the rest of the council. So by the time he pulls this trick, the council's all on his side. Which, and, uh, which is it? Which the thing? The thing that's important is that t- is that taking this quick lesson is the is due to the fact that. He in in enforcing that heck that hexgate lockdown, he ended up pissing off all of the count all of the other council members, especially the ones who had vested economic interests. Mm-hmm. It's as we said earlier, Piltover has become an economic powerhouse because they are the central hub for all trade. Mm-hmm. Everything that that travels through a hexgate has to go to them before being. Shot off to a different X gate. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of incentive for counselors to take kickbacks, and also all their fancy exports, the the fine finer things in life that they like that don't get created in Piltover. Some of which are even technically contraband. Which he drugs. He asked, there's an old saying. The young man knows all the rules. The old man knows all the exceptions. Yep. This is his process of learning all the exceptions. Mm-hmm. And in the in the in the pro, in the process of in the process of this, um, Victor ends up. In his desperation, meeting up with an old friend of his back in the lanes. The person who we've seen plenty of times up to this point and kind of the driving force with the when it comes to the research of Shimmer. The man known as Singed. It, when we learned that when Victor was a kid, he first met Singed and a, mu- a mutant uh, that he had created. And... Um, was disillusioned with Singed when Singed hooked up this mutant life form to what was essentially an extremely cruel life support system that forced it to stay alive with what looked to be the predecessor to Shimmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and Singed's point was the sample must survive. Implying that above all else, things have to survive if they're to get anything done. And the entire reason Victor returns is, again, that desperation that he's dying. He is the sample that must survive in this case. Mm -hmm. And to make to make things even worse, Silco decides to play a little bit of mind games, including visiting his including play, including playing House of Cards with his daughter. To or to order him to kill to kill Caitlyn and Vi. And I do like I do like the mind games that were played here because he he acts like it because the way he acts with Marcus's daughter is is almost like a is almost like a nice uncle. Yeah, he just Marcus opens the door to his daughter's room, and he's just sitting there playing card, playing the house of cards with the do- with the girl, mm-hmm. just being all friendly, just like, ah, sheriff, so pleased to see you. Just having some time with your daughter doesn't give any direct threats whatsoever. Just, but just his mere presence is a threat. Mm-hmm. And. Th- all, and all the more, all the more so when he casually knocks down the house of cards with a whoops, and it even though it's very cl- it's very clear that that oops was the th- was part of the threat. Yeah, 
I am. Um, what I tell you, or your house of cards comes crumbling down. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's really funny is that it seems even Marcus's daughter gets this. She starts getting a scared look on her face at that point. Like she realizes this guy's not as friendly as he tries to play himself as. Kids are smarter than you think, folks. <laughs> I should yeah. know I have two of my own. Mm -hmm. They know too much already. Yeah. But. Because. But so I should I should note that early on early on in the early on in this arc, Vi had a bit of a tussle with one of with the with Silco's top enforcer, Savika, who's had some upgrades since she lost her arm a few years back. Himmer Tech is a hell of a drug. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and it is through it is through it is through the attempts to try and to try and get help that we see the dark side of the ship of the shimmer distribution, namely the people that are at the bottom of the bottom of the lanes. Yeah. Now, as they imply, like the, this this basically tent city in the lanes. Had a few residents to begin with, people who just were just completely uncurable for whatever reason. But ever since Shimmerum had become on the rise, that particular part of the lanes had exploded in population because not everyone can handle Shimmer all that well. And we end up seeing what we end up seeing one familiar face who looks absolutely nothing like he did in Act One. You know, to hit to hit home the to hit home the fact that. The that what Silco's what Silco's done, it is far is far worse than what the status quo what that Vander was trying to maintain was. Like Van Vander was by no means a saint, but at the at the very least he was able to keep things somewhat stable. He was the filter. Mm hmm. And with him, with him gone, and the sh and shimmer smuggling, going full swing, this has been the result. But we do we um, the act ends up the act ends with the with obviously the preparation of Piltor's defenses on the bridge, which. Is a, which is another bit of callback to the to the bridge incident from all those years ago, but also, and also the moment with the flare. Yeah, back back when uh when Vi left Powder at the hideout when they were going to save Vander, uh, she gave Powder a flare and said, "No matter what, wherever you set this off, I will see it." I will come and find you. Mm -hmm. At this point, Jinx has found out that Vi is alive because Silco told her Vi was dead because Marcus told Silco Vi was dead. And when Jinx found out, she decided to take to take it out in Savika. Beat the shit out of her, hang her up by, uh, by on the ceiling painted with the word liar on her. Mm -hmm. You know, her usual. <laughs> um, and Jinx is conflicted. She's supposed to have let Powder die, but now she knows Vi is alive. So she goes at at the big climax of this whole episode. They're running away from all of the all of the shit that's going on. They've gotten away from Silco's uh, Shimmer monsters he created out of those people at the deepest ditch of of Zon. The Shimmer version um, of a big daddy. It looks like in some cases, pretty yeah. much. And they and as they're running to get back to Piltover, Vi notices Jinx's flare. And this was actually a super good fake out because mm -hmm. Vi's so far away from the flare. And then it goes back to Jinx, who is still holding up the flare until it sputters. And you think, oh, Vi didn't go to the flare so they could escape. And Jinx is standing there for just a beat. It's just a long enough beat to make you think, oh, that's how this episode ends. And then Vi is like, powder? And everything comes to 
essentially a second climax. Mm-hmm. They it's, one of those, it's long enough to make you think, oh, this is good. This is the this is where she t- powder truly breaks and is dead. And now it's, she is James. Nope. No. And they have a second climax, essentially. Uh, Vi and, and powder talk and reunite. And then Caitlin's there. And Caitlin's like, your sister is Jinx. And Jinx is like, you're with an enforcer? Because uh, Savika even told uh, Jinx that Vi was with an enforcer. Mm-hmm. And, well, Jinx didn't believe her. Part of the reason she, she does now. <laughs> yeah. She did then. <laughs> so and- they, they're all arguing, and the firelights show up. And hmm. Absolutely wreck house, taking the gemstone and kidnapping Caitlin and Vi. I should note that there's two things that the Firelights have have to their advantage. One, being very good at ambush tactics. And two, their grenades. The ones that cover people in some sort of earth crystal magic stuff? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. They only last for a few minutes, but a few minutes is all you need. Mm-hmm. And with the and of course, of course, they end up taking the firelights end up taking the gemstone and um kit and kidnapping both Caitlin and Vi. Yes. Which leads us to Act Three and. One thing that I do find kind of kind of interesting is it opens it opens up with with this set with this hip hop interlude that ki- that kind of shows the that kind of shows the visual identity of the firelights. It was actually really really cool too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it had a, it had a much more distinct and almost it looked almost hand drawn as a visual style. Or hand yeah. painted. It didn't have the same 3D that we'd been seeing throughout the whole series, or the and, CG effect. Yeah, look, the the way I describe it is animated graffiti. Which, um, when he when he said that, I'm like, huh, Samurai Champloo, mm. because nice. a, lot, a, mm. a, a lot of a lot of the uh, that visual motif, animated graffiti, as you put it. Um, is very reminiscent of some of the parts of, Sh- of Samurai Champloo or of Afro Samurai or of a bunch of other things where uh, hip hop is involved in animation. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm pretty sure there were even some moments of animated graffiti in the boondocks, but that's a different story. Yeah. And of, of course, um, of course we could, of course we could always, we could always bring up the King of Funky Fresh Beats. <laughs> Uh, hmm. but it's first off i did like the perspective that we end up getting shortly afterwards of of a first person perspective with the bag on yeah that was really well done Mm -hmm. it's also where i end up making the joke of could you at least wash the bag (laughs) which if it sounds like i stole that joke from burn notice well, that's because I did, and because more people need to watch Burn Notice. Good shit. Not just for Bruce Campbell, although he certainly helps. It should be yeah. the number one reason, but not the entire reason. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Bruce Campbell should be the number one reason. Maybe the number two. The number one reason should be it's an actually good story. Yeah. Fair. It's also good research material if you want to do a spy fiction campaign. And then I'm watching so it. Fair. I can attest. Mm-hmm. But... but it, this is where we. This is where we get the revelation that the member of the Firelights, with who is basically leading the crew, is a grown-up Echo who has very much seen some shit. He's far. He's far from the. Ki- he's far from the meek little ki- meek little kid who du- who dusted off shelves that he was years ago. Yeah, motherfucker looks badass. We'll put mm-hmm. it that way. Yeah. Uh, and this is this is where this is where he ends up being able to give a bit of perspective on one the sanctuary that the firelights have created and two the the um 
the way the way things ended up going ended up going south after after Vi got locked up. Then after Vander was killed, yeah. Mm-hmm. What's really cool about the sanctuary they're in is somehow, some way, it's never revealed how either. They have a living plant, a giant tree in that sanctuary, which, according to everything everyone knows about the Undercity, is impossible. Mm -hmm. Because of the pollution and how far down it is, it's just not viable. They they have fungus growing down there, sure, but not, like, full-on trees. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, one I've some might argue that 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 is a plot hole. I don't think it is. Well, we saw in Victor's flashback that there are parts of the lanes and parts of Zon that are nearer the surface than others mm-hmm. that do get sunlight. Mm-hmm. And it's not really a plot hole because we know that the firelights have been doing something other than just stopping Shimmer. They've been doing more than just that one thing. So there had to be other things they discovered along the way to offer all the outcasts, people who have lost their families and their lives in this takeover of the lanes by Silco, um, a, a sanctuary as uh, to live in. Mm-hmm. A, a sanctuary from the, from the chaos of the rest of the world. A man after my own heart. Yeah. But... You're only saying that because he's black. Fuck off. Uh. (laughs) Hey, hey, hey! It's a a variant on on the joke. It counts. That's why I'm saying fuck off. I was more talking at at, uh, at Shades there with his (laughs) sigh. And anyways... Oh, the while the the other the the other um in the on the piltover end of the story we do have Mel talking Jason to working on he, on hex tech material along with along with giving a bit of I think this is where we ended up getting a bit of um what <laughs> what Jace probably does in his off time. You mean beating hammers? Mm-hmm. Make your make your Iron Man cartoon jokes. <laughs> oh. Mel is also a little upset at him at first. Because he's been away and distant after Victor. Mm-hmm. Which can you blame the man? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we also get some backstory on on Mel and her uh, her background of her family back in Noxus mm-hmm. about how as as at a very young age she was kind of being groomed to be the leader of the country now that they now that her family had basically overthrown it mm-hmm. and she was told that she should outright kill the the remainder of the previous royal family because her family is a family of warlords essentially she's like but this is our chance to look merciful we should keep her as a puppet who won't fuck with us and then her mother kills the woman fuck mercy Mm -hmm. and her mother's point was either kill this one now or potentially kill thousands later later Mm -hmm. She mad. Yeah. And the now Grant now at the same time Singe had suggested using using Shimmer to uh, to um assist the development of the Hex Core. That Shimmer that what was it? Nature is naturally resistant to change. Shimmer makes things more flexible. Which and so, go ahead. It certainly works. I mean, Victor at this point is almost as insane at jinx about some things. Mm-hmm. Um, the man literally carves runes into his own flesh, injects himself with shimmer, and grabs on to the to the hex core, which 
yes, the hex core could do miraculous things, inspire the growth of living material, but that stuff would immediately start rotting away afterwards. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see just how bad that can go. Not the first time. The second time is where is where it goes bad, bad. Oh, yeah. The first time it just kind of sputters out, but I think that at that point he'd only carved the runes on his gear, mm -hmm. not on himself. And the second yeah. time he carves the gear, the runes on himself out of desperation. And this is where we see a character, a, a, a one a side character that really didn't get much. There was this an, another assistant who. We hadn't seen much of, but we knew from what little we saw was developing a bit of a crush on Victor. Mm -hmm. Was practice in, in in this case, she was practicing a way to ask him out casually on a date. Mm -hmm. You know, to give a, a man hope. Sorry, yeah, lady. Well, uh, <laughs> a little too late. Yeah, a little too late for that, as you're about to learn. Yeah, but before Vic that, I should I should note that. You that after a bit, after a bit of tension, Echo agrees to get Echo agrees to help them get to the bridge to get in to get back into Piltover, and it's on the con it's on the condition that he's the one who gets to deliver the gemstone, which you know how it is you know how it is in the show no no good no good deed goes unpunished. Because they do get to the bridge, and things get worse because that because Marcus shows up with a whole with a whole bar with a whole barricade and an ass ton of enforcers in the process. So, so you know, basically the fuck shit up, and try and tries to get and tries to get rid of both of them with the mindset of, I I told I told you to stay out of this, but. Just when you think things are getting bad, just remember they can get worse because it seems that a bunch of fire lights show up on the bridge, except those aren't fire lights. They're robots. Jinx! Caitlin gets wounded. Marcus ends up dead. Most of the enforcers get wrecked. And the only ones left are. Um, are. The ones with plot armor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, this is don't, we, don't try to mince words. <laughs> yeah, plot. I will note that that um, Echo decides to decides to take Jinx decides to take Jinx on himself, and this is where we get one a very interesting flashback style shot. Um. Yeah. It in a weird way, in a weird way, it kind of it kind of reminds me of the mental battle in the film Hero. Both of both of them not moving, juxtaposed with the with the watch that Echo carries with him, and it and it flashing back to that to them as kids. As an, Play fighting before they're about to have a real fight, but ultimately Echo isn't able to do the final blow, and Jinx is no, has no problem with liberal use of grenades. Essentially nearly killing herself and him. Mm -hmm. Like we said, very generous with, with the liberal use there. And to make now to make Soko did find Jinx. And brought her to Singe to try and get to try and get her healed. Except this is Singe, and Singe does not exactly have a bedside manner all that developed. <laughs> not only That's does he not, not only does he not have a bedside manner, the man is not a doctor. Mm -hmm. He's he's a scientist, and an unethical one at that. But what's oh, interesting? Are scientists supposed to be doctors? Not all scientists have to get doctorates. Yeah, but what is interesting is, and this is hinted up until this point, one would think that Soko just Soko just sees Jinx as as um a as a pawn for hit for his cause. When by this point, it's very clear that that's not exactly the case. You remember how when we talked about Samurai X, we brought we brought up how. 
Tomoe eventually eventually grew to love the person who who caused her who caused her the tragedy in her life. Yeah, mm-hmm. we have a, we have something not far off with Soko in this, where he genuinely does see himself as her as her father. Yeah, for all of his psychoticness and for all his cruelty to other people, you can genuinely see that he does actually care for Jinx mm-hmm. in his own weird, twisted way. And something something else that it and it's, when it comes to um Vic, when it comes to Victor's experiments well it was successful he it he's able he's able to run, he's able to walk and even run again with a with a brand new leg made of some sort of magic metal mhm but this was also where sky ended up get ended up getting killed in order to try and cure himself further, he that's when he finally started inscribing the runes on himself and in so doing touched the hex core directly. Mm-hmm. Which Sky panics and's like, "No, no, no, you're going to die if you do that." He's um, fine. He has the well, uh, he has the runes inscribed on himself. She he doesn't. She doesn't. She doesn't have the protections in place that he does. Mhm. And uh it all falls to ashes. Literally, yeah. yeah. She she gets yeah, pooped. Uh, ring around the rosy. <laughs> and yeah. to make thing to make things worse, the one of the aces in the hole was going to be Caitlyn making testimony about Silco being a threat. Except it except it did except it fell on deaf ears with all but one of the council. Which yep. Results in a partnership with with Vi and Jace, where they where Vi ends up suggesting, if you want to hit if you want to hit Silco, hit him hit him where it hurts his wallet. At place where it hurts for mm-hmm. yep. Place where it hurts for all drug kingpins. And this is this is also where we get to see, um, Jace end up creating his and his own hex tech weaponry, which. We fucking want one. <laughs> yeah, that hammer is baller. I think I made the joke that somewhere, a, somewhere, a son of Odin is looking at that and going, "Why couldn't I have that?" You did. Make that <laughs> Why'd you give me Mjolnir or, or <laughs> instead of that? And this, I, I was actually poking fun at Stormbringer, but same, but not Stormbringer, Stormbreaker, but same deal. I got it. I got a hammer. I got a hammer axe when I could have had a hammer gun. Also, that also that hammer gun is be- is better designed than a lot of the hybrid weapons I've been seeing in Ruby over the last few years. Did I say that out? Low, low bar. Yeah, low, yeah, yeah, low bar. But. In the process, a kid ends up get a kid ends up getting killed, and there's one there's one other um, one other minor thing I want I want to highlight because it's a good scene of don't of don't fuck with Silco. Silco, because of the fact that he has control of the Shimmer, he has control of the gangs. Essentially, essentially the essentially the head the set of families. With Silco being the godfather in this instance, yeah, and they have been, they have been frustrated with how difficult it is to do business, and one of them, Finn, who I found out is played by Miyavi of all people, yeah, that was a nice detail. Accuses Silco of getting soft in his old age. And to which Sil- Silco <laughs> reply, replies with, uh, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Silco replies with, "Here, you can all choke on what air in the in the lanes used to be like." Yep. Part. And everybody, everybody ends up getting brought to heel, and Finn is the la- is the last one to to, to um take the hint. Because they had called that they had called this meeting with him, he ends up pulling that move on them and then leaves saying, Good meeting. 
<laughs> but in the but in the I sh I should note that the other thing that's been hinted at is a bit of a romance between Caitlyn and Vi. Nothing out nothing outright blatant for so, for some sort of for some sort of um Twitter points. But something that is an something that is far more natural. But Vi ends up breaking it up, claiming that the two are oil and water. Hey, there's the there's the title. Ah, roll credits. Yeah, and once again, once again, we have one. Of, we have a case of. Jinx is very stealthy for some for somebody with the biggest braids in the universe. <laughs> well, the braids aren't covered in bills. Lot of bitch in the building. Mm -hmm. Stealth. Natural 20s every time. Because we have a bit we we have a bit of a shower scene regard with um Caitlin, and one would think, okay, you're getting your fan service in, but then as the as the fog comes away from the giant mirror. You see, you see, I'm up. You see a, you see the, you see what looks like one of the monkey drawings that always show up whenever Jinx is around, and she's in the background, which is a very good setup and follow through, and very well executed in this case too. Like you don't get any indication it's coming until all of a sudden you see that 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 image there, and you're like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. But. After the after the raid that went south, Jace comes to the realization that tr that a f a war a war between the two cities would not end well for either side, and although Zon would be end up, would end up being wiped off the face of the map if it truly went to blows, mm -hmm. and tries to tries to parlay with Silco, and the thing that I find funny is Silco does not take him seriously. At first. Mm -hmm. At first. Because Silco thinks that he's desperate and that he showed his hand by immediately asking for parlay after one skirmish. Mm -hmm. And that's when Jace says, yeah, I am desperate. I'm terrified because this conflict proved to me that if we went to blows, there's no way you guys would survive. Mm -hmm. Silco's like, wait a minute. Are you threatening me? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I just want. I don't want. I Jace is literally going. No, I. I don't want anybody else to die. Period. Mm -hmm. And the term. And um, what I think the I think the other thing is that um, the terms that Silco gives basically full on independence for Zom. And unmitigate and unfettered shipping, unmitigated uh, oh, total amnesty for all crimes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Basically, giving Zound the biggest upper hand ever. And Which, oh. yeah, I'm willing to bet he didn't honestly think that was going to go through. He was, he just figured he'd go all balls in because he, because of uh, Jason's desperation. Thinking, uh, either he'll give me that, or he'll at least negotiate a decent deal out of this. But no. <laughs> a com a common tactic is to overplay your first bid and then work them downward, and then work downwards into something that could be seen as reasonable. It's the most common um, negotiation tactic on the planet. Yeah. yeah. Except this backfired hard because he wasn't uh, negotiating from any position of power. And Jace's counter is. I will give you all of that, but you have to give me Jinx. Which, as we've seen with Silco, isn't that's a no go. Yeah, Silco is like, I'll do, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <sighs> Meatloaf is. It's a good reference. Mm -hmm. Shut up. No, I'm not saying it's a bad reference. He's saying he misses Meatloaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all do. But in the pro in the process of the in the process of this, he did he he does um. It's it's at this point where it's very clear that 
Jace has has very has well learned the the politic the art of politics. There's one other th- there's one other thing that ha- that happens around this time that I think is worth talking about, and it could be argued that this is a glorified setup for for down the road, but we'll but um, I'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Mel's mother shows up. Oh. Who um there while she spends a bit of time sampling the local cuisine, if you know what I mean. And I think, and I think we do. <laughs> brown chicken, brown cow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um er, eh, er, eh, er, eh. Except this time it is implied it's never showed. Yeah. I, I mean the naked bathtub scene is more than implication, Jades. Okay, you're right there, but they don't show the act itself. Yeah. No, Just that's because the aftermath. Take a, mm-hmm. that's, that's because she's taking a bath afterwards. Yeah. yeah. All right, boys, for the sake of brevity, they fucking move on. <laughs> <laughs> but Mel does not take Mel does not take her sh- her um her mother showing up all too well. Or kindly, for that matter. Yeah. And it's very because she is a because she is a warmonger, and Mel is more is more of a diplomat, pacifist. Not a pacifist. No, no, She's no, willing pacifist. to call, just peacekeeper. Better word. She's Fair. she's willing to use her diplomacy to avoid conflict and only use conflict as the last resort. Mm-hmm. Whereas her mother sees conflict as the first and last resort. The analogy only the the analogy that's used between them is the difference between the wolf and the fox. Yep, she says, "I will teach you to be a wolf," and uh, well, Mel refuses to play ball, which results in her exile. And the sole reason she came back is. Apparently, Mel's brother pissed somebody off who vast, whose military power vastly outstrips her mother's. And she and she believes that Hextech weaponry is the get is the get out of jail free card that she needs. Because, because even though even though even though Mel's brother has was ki- was killed in her, in his attempt at diplomacy, that person does not feel that the debt has been paid, and yeah. who wants blood? That's not negotiable. But just to to, to make. Th- now, fortunately, there is some there is some bit of good of good news in the in the in the sense that um, Heimerdinger, who's been visiting, who's been just walking walking around the cities, um, visits Zound in the in the name of helping out locals, and meets up with Echo, who managed to survive, albeit with a broken leg. And he sees Echo's engineering is like, this is amazing. But it looks like the blades on this are wrong. Mm-hmm. And Echo corrects him with, no, 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 no. Those blades are made for, for further in the fissures. Those aren't made for up here. Mm-hmm. The air is thicker in the fissures due to all the toxic gases. Mm-hmm. And this, this journey of Heimerdinger's is a way for him to shift his own perspective. This mm-hmm. is very clearly a vehicle to get Heimerdinger out of his safety first and only mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he has to see what, why everyone else is in such a rush to improve because for them, time is not exactly a luxury. Mm-hmm. Well, and not it's only that, worse. not only that, there's a, there's a really good line that uh that echo gives as they get 
to the sanctuary, it's not just about people surviving. It's about giving people what they need to live. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just about giving people what they need to survive. It's what they giving them what they need to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was a that was a banger of a quote. I yeah. called it out when Beautiful I heard it. Quote. Mm -hmm. This last episode was knocking out some top tier quotes left and fucking right. Oh yeah, yeah. And I should note that it, in a bit, there was also a bit of um, callbacks because Victor goes to the, goes to the hidey hole that he's got that he's gone to plenty of times throughout the series, and, and he's contemplating walking off the ledge over his get over his guilt. Almost a callback to what Jace was doing back in the beginning of the series. And to even further call back, Jace, Jace shows up and says, am I interrupting? <laughs> and he, he asks Jace to promise him to destroy the Hex Core because he can't do it. He tried and couldn't get himself to do it. And then the Hex Core knocked him out. Mm -hmm. And... One of the other really good scenes in the, in this episode that I re I really liked, and I think a few people have used it for the one villainous scene challenge when Nando V movies was, was doing that, is Silco um, sitting at sitting at a at a memorial for Vander, um, and almost almost and um almost like he's sharing a drink with his with his estranged brother. Even poured some out for him. Mm hmm. Saying. I have the opportunity to get to get everything that I want to get everything that I ever wanted for my cause. I I fought I fought for the cause for most of my life, and now the and now the end goal is right in front of me, and yet I can't do it. I don't want it. Mm -hmm. Not at the cost that they're telling me. Mm -hmm. Daughters really? What was it? Da daughters really ruin a man, or something like that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Except uh, once again. Someone overheard him mm -hmm. and I'm misunderstood him. Jinx rolls stealth like a bitch. Mm -hmm. Natural twenty on stealth. Natural twenty. Mm -hmm. Oh, and mean and meanwhile you get meanwhile you got the GM looking at the dice to make sure there's no bullshit. A la a certain scene that you're that you and I are familiar with, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> But this is also where we get one of the one of the really good fights in the matter because if you're gonna have a tavern, the rules of fiction dictate you must have a bar fight. And all of a sudden, you see as as Sevec, Se, uh, Sevica Sevica is just chilling out, huffing, uh, having some drinks, sm smoking a cigar. You start to notice some thing activity going on outside as another patron is heading over to the jukebox. And next thing you know, it walks in Vi, armed to the teeth. Mm -hmm. Literally. <laughs> I should note that there was one other really good fake out in this episode before I get to that fight. It because Finn had Finn had been since Finn got his ass kicked by Silco, he had been trying to work Sevica. He tried approaching him. He tried approaching her once. Saying, saying that, saying, why don't you, why don't you come work with me, and you'll, and you'll actually get respected. And she was like, I'll think about it, and 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 had the attitude of, I'm, I'm not doing it. Then Finn, then Finn shows up. Then Finn tries it again because, well, the kid that got killed in the in the in the raid, that was the that was the son of one of the of one of the of one of the gang lords. And she doesn't take it all that well, which prompts another which prompts another confrontation on the matter. And you would think, with the way it was shot, that Savika was going to was going to um tur was going to turn on her boss. And yet, instead, Finn ends up being the one who gets iced. Yeah, the the way they set it up is brilliant. Soko is just talking about how, again, referring to how the lanes used to be, how the and things kept falling apart. But the one thing that always kept things together was loyalty. And mm -hmm. right as he says that, that's when Sevika makes her move. Mm -hmm. 
and the way it's set up, you would. Th- it looks for it looks for a second that Soko gets his head chopped off. And granted, he loses his drink. A waste of, what a waste of good whiskey. Yeah. But Finn is the one who get who gets killed in the who gets killed in the process. And that's and that and like I said, it's a it is a damn good fake out because we've seen this kind of thing happen so often in fiction uh, to the point where it may as well be called the Roman handshake. <laughs> Isn't that trope called the Roman handshake? I don't think that's the official name. That's just what I call it. <laughs> but. The th- the um the other eh, but when it comes to the fight with Vi and S- and Savika, unlike the last one which was one sided, this is a little less so. But it also reveals that Echo was ri- Echo was right about Vi with one thing: she blocks with her face. Yeah, she tends to take the brunt of the attack, and she gets get next knock. They both get knocked down. Savika starts to get up for another for the next round, and all of a sudden, Vi gets a chance to talk with somebody who she hasn't got to talk to in a long time. Mm-hmm. And she gets to hear the voice of Vander in her head. Also, I did like a, a little spot in the middle of it where they where she ends up taking a break to have a drink. <laughs> that was a nice little neat little thing. That mm-hmm. was cool. Oh, but. It's shortly after that. It's shortly after that fight, with with Savika losing her arm again. That Jinx decides to swoop in, and this is where and another fucking natural twenty. Yeah, yeah. This is where we end up having um, having what I called the chamber play. I also made references to American McGee, because you have this table that's almost almost set up like a. Macabre version of a din- of of a family dinner, complete with mm. dolls of of the, of her of the dead members of the family, and a kit and a tied up ver- a tied up version of both Caitlyn and v- and Vi there, along with Silco, who's get who's gagged in the process, and and Jinx has the mindset of where should I sit. You see one seat with Powder's name on it, and one seat with Jinx's name on it. And and it's not even just that their names are on it; it's how their each chair is designed very differently. The Powder chair is very is kind of cutesy, but otherwise kind of normal looking, kind of basic. Mm-hmm. Jinx chair is very twisted, very, very, very much macabre looking. There's also a whole lot of crows. There's crows' feathers. Yeah. Crows all over the all over the place in the environment. Um, it almost looks like a it almost looks like a twisted throne. And Vi is given a pistol and sh- and told to choose but choose either shoot either shoot Kate either shoot Caitlyn or shoot um or shoot Jinx. No 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 no. She just simply said. Mm-hmm. You want me back as your sister? Kill her. Mm-hmm. No, she said, make her go away. Yeah. But that was what she was applying. If you want me back as mm-hmm. Powder, she she, she didn't, has to go. Long the, story the short, Powder, uh, Jinx says, kill the bitch. Mm-hmm. I, I think, no, I think in, in this case, Monk's interpretation is right. She hands her a pistol and just says, make her go away. Not telling her which her to shoot. Mm-hmm. That's one of those open interpretation type of deals. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of that. And Vi attempts to appeal to her memories, which cut co- which causes her hallucinations to look to look more like monsters att- attacking her. It makes uh, it worse. Mm-hmm. And Silco was not helping because he was also doing the same thing. Yeah. Well, b- before all this, um. Before all this, Jinx shoots a, a glass, and Caitlin uses that to get out of her bonds and pick up Jinx's uh, minigun, 
and pointed at her and says, put down the pistol, which she puts down in front of Silco and then attacks Caitlin unexpectedly with that very quick zip to her um, and then takes her minigun back. And that's when Vi and Silco start, um, if you'll excuse the pun, vying for her attention. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I called it a chamber play. You kind of have the shoulder angel and shoulder devil going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a shoulder devil and a shoulder devil and 10,000 voices in one little brain. Mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, Silco also manages to get himself partially out of his bonds and picks up the pistol, which causes Jinx to shoot in the direction of the threat because she doesn't want Vi to get killed. Um, But also immediately horrifies her because she's, she's killed him. Mm-hmm. He's dying. And she's like, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. And he's like, I never would have given you up. Not for the world. Essentially. And after that, even though the, even though the whole thing was set up as if it was going to be Vi's choice, Jinx ends up making the choice for her with the mindset of, you, uh, I thought, even though I'm different, I thought we could go back to the way things were, but you've changed too. Yep. So, the, to the new us. Yeah, I think I think the trigger for that, honestly, was when Silco said, I wouldn't have given you up, not for anything. And then he says, you're perfect. Mm-hmm. Implying that it w- he really did accept her for who she was now and wasn't looking for some nostalgic version of her or some change within her and that's why uh jinx was like i thought you could accept me even though i am what i am now Mm -hmm. and the and the final thing is the fact that there was up until this point there was talk about web about weaponizing the gemstone and this yeah. is where we see the rocket launcher that get that would be used in the game as her alt. Fish bones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I don't think we brought this up, but when before Caitlyn was rolled out, Jinx tried to imply that she had a guest with her and that she had her friend Caitlyn with her and laid down a plate, in uh, a covered plate. Mm-hmm. I made and her a course, snack. Yeah, made her a snack. Now, Vi, of course... Hearing this and the implication behind it, thinking, oh, well, God, we're going to see Caitlyn's head on a plate, which was what they were going for for the setup. But then she lifts it up, and it's a cupcake with the gems on the top. Like, come on, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> he literally says that line, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He does. She's like, I know. <laughs> she which... Literally playing, yeah, I know you guys think I'm out of my goddamn mind, but even I have my standards here, people. Um, I think what's, I think what's amusing about it is that cupcake has been the nickname that... <laughs> Vi has that Vi has given Caitlyn throughout the series. I think Jinx knows that. Yeah, mm-hmm. she probably overheard him at some point, so that was why she did that. It was a nice little uh, jab. But that's what leads to the rocket launcher, which he loads the gemstone into. And as the council is finally agreeing to have pe- to make peace with Zahn, that's when Jinx fires the rocket launcher right at the council room. Mm-hmm. And this is where I was mentioning linchpins earlier. <laughs> this is this is definitely where I was mentioning linchpins and dominoes. Mm-hmm. Heimerdinger, yeah. Heimerdinger's warning that you need to make hex tech unable to be abused by others, and and there it is being abused by. Oh, he's others. not done. He's not done. Let him finish. And all of the uh, implications of of making things for the world for the for the better mm-hmm. things like uh jace's ambitions to do good there was even that line uh we lost who we were in, in, instead of doing good we were obsessed with uh, uh victor said we lost who we were instead of doing good we we got lost doing doing what was great no no and in, in, in the effort to do great we forgot how to do good yes mm-hmm. thank you and there's all of these little dominoes that were set up over and over, whether it's uh, the fact that um, the council demands its pound of flesh 
in both the past and the present, whether it's the fact that a uh, Heimerdinger was willing to uh, was not willing to allow Hextech to do what it could because he was worried about its safety. All of these cautionary phrases that the ambitions and strive for greatness were seemingly proving wrong were all set up to ultimately prove them right. Even if Heimerdinger's viewpoint is changing because he's being exposed directly to Zahn and the people within it, that particular point was never wrong. That little, that little tiny bit of, of, uh, you know, you need to make sure that this magnificently powerful thing is also ultimately safely within control so that it can't be used in a way that does the exact opposite of what he wanted to do, make the world better, um, was ultimately a correct decision, just overzealously play. And that's, I think, the ultimate uh, caveat about this whole thing. People were playing to their own passions without regard to tempering those passions in the view of the, lo of the larger picture. Mm -hmm. Even Heimer, even Heimerdinger's uh, points were not reasoned. They were, they were emotive intuitive intuition. This was Heimerdinger was like seek safety at all cost because of fear, not because well that safety will prevent others from causing harm. It was no. This is this thing is harmful in and of itself, and that was his panic. If Heimerdinger had taken the time to sit down with Jace all the way back at the beginning and talk with him rationally, be like, well, the reason I think you need to have safeties is of the fact that y yes, this can be a miraculous construct, but imagine if anybody else gets a hold of it and they do things with it you never would. You know, there's he if he had made the emphasis more on if bad actors get this tool, the tool will become bad, or at least the tool will be used in bad ways, rather than the tool itself is bad, destroy it. Heimerdinger may have been able to convince Victor and Jace all the way back before they even got Jace reinstated with the with the academy um, that safety safety's in place should also be warranted, which would have prevented a lot of the of the conflict at least with the gemstone itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a very large domino effect all the way from the beginning. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what we call good writing. And I think this, I think this is the re this is the reason why, um, why this particular season has been has been so well received is you have the combination of a very a very memorable animation style with writing that's strong enough to the point where even if you're not even if you're not familiar with with league um, you're a, you're able to follow this particular story of essentially essentially a series of tragedies. And that's why this season, in a, in a bubble, where it, you know a lot of people, it ends on such a downer. It, it does this, it does that, all all these emotions. But th this is where in lies the the true uh, genre of this. It's the first season, the first season or the series, as presented so far, is a tragedy, and a damn good one at that. Mm hmm. And it's also a setup for, ultimately, down the line, the described conflict between Piltover and Zaun within the actual setting of League of Legends. Mm -hmm. This this set up the major players, including champions that we know from the games, uh, specifically, you know, the four main champions that we know from the games, Vi, Jinx, Caitlyn, and Jace. Mm -hmm. We also have... Other champions that weren't given as big a spotlight, Echo, Heimerdinger, Singed, Victor. Mm -hmm. 
uh, all given their roots. And there are there are se- there are seeds that are still that are still planted regarding regarding a season two, which they which has been announced will be coming in sometime after twenty twenty two. Because you have you uh, obviously the hex core still isn't destroyed. You have Heimerdinger wor- working wor- working with the people of Sanctuary. Yep. And with Echo, yeah, yeah, not, and um, and you have and you have the fa- and you have the fact that obviously, obviously, this is this is where Jinx dis- goes f- as gone pa- gone past the gone past the deep end, and the de- and the complete the implied annihilation of mo of everybody in the council. Except for the people we know uh, survive, mm-hmm. specifically Victor and and uh, Jace. Mm-hmm. However, this does mean that this is a this is Jinx finally fulfilling her her League of Legends music video. Get jinxed. <laughs> yeah. Although um the funny thing is is that is that the is that um that music video and what we see here are they couldn't be further apart in terms of tone. I know. I'm just saying that this is her becoming that person. Mm-hmm. But it it does it does certainly certainly color things. And as far and I'm pretty, I know it's only a matter of time before we do see a season two, and we'll probably end up doing this again when that drops. It's just it's just a matter of patience, and I am very patient. Um, and I think I think something else we should point out since we've done it in the past is the is the voice cast because. There's not while there are a few familiar names, I wouldn't say there's a massive amount of familiar names. Now, you got to go pretty far down the line and, and it like not, like I some of the main cast is pretty well known. Like Vi is voiced by Haley Steinland who actually has a pretty big career. Mm-hmm. Uh, most Stein. notably, she was the voice of Gwen Stacy in Spider-Verse. Mm-hmm. Haley Steinfeld got to correct you there. Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. Um, Jinx is voiced by um, Ella P- Ella Purnell, who I'd say is I'd say is more well known as a um, as a, a as a full on actress than a voice actress. Yeah, Absolutely. a lot of them are. Like for example, uh, Caitlin is voiced by Katie Leung, who, uh, who most probably will probably know as Cho Chang from the Harry Potter movies. Mm-hmm. Um, Jace Tallis is voiced by Ke- by Kevin Ale- by Kevin Alejandro, who again this is is somebody who's more known for um, live action work rather than animated work. Yep. Um, He's brother blood in the in the in the DC TV verse. Mm-hmm. Um, Silco is but is um Jace is Jason Spisak. That might actually be a name people recognize, mm-hmm. though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Harry Harry Lloyd is definitely a case is who voices Victor, and I'm and I'm sitting here going, well, he did pre- he did pretty well for himself since the last time I saw him. He was a he was frozen in time as a scarecrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he he was in the he was in the. The 2006 Robin Hood by um, that was done by the BBC, as well as, of course, um, Family of Blood in Doctor Who, and he was Viserys Targaryen in season one Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um. Now, as, as far as like anime voice actors go, you gotta you gotta go into the supporting cast to find anyone. You got uh, Yuri Fred, Lowenthal, Yuri Lowenthal, Fred Tastacori, Erica Lindbeck. Roger like, Craig I know Smith. a few of these names. Yeah, Roger yeah. Craig Smith. Yeah. Fred Josh Cacciore. Cacciore. Mm-hmm. 
Terry Walgren's even got a small voice in there. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as we pointed out earlier, uh, artist Miyavi as Finn. Mm -hmm. I love the fact, imagine dragons J.I.D. and Ray Chen all as themselves. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, th um, I think Ray Chen was what was... I don't recall if he had any speaking vo if he had any speaking voices. I think he was supposed I think he was supposed to be the violinist during that during the wheeling and dealing scene. Mm -hmm. But we've we've even got you know me like I said members of uh, the um, of some pretty uh, recognizable names having to do with uh, with. Gaming, uh, Roger Craig Smith and and uh, Dave B. Mitchell, both of uh, Sonic, mm -hmm. <laughs> Sonic and, and Knuckles, respectively, actually. And in the case of Roger Day, Roger Craig Smith, the best character in the Assassin's Creed series. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the primary cast was more live action actors in most cases. Mm hmm. Which, considering they have Netflix money, getting some big name actors wasn't a bad was wasn't a bad call, and they didn't get like they got people who could ha who understood how to do act voice acting to some extent. Like it didn't feel like these guys didn't couldn't voice act. Which, trust me, folks, acting on uh, acting on camera and acting in a uh, voice acting similar but also very different. <laughs> yeah, I've um, I've I'm pretty sure you and I have both been have both been given some stories when. When somebody um for, when somebody first realizes the difference, yeah, because you know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> none of us made a a um Vermeyer joke in the Victor scene. Yeah, Sky Sky was voiced by Kimberly Brooks, aka Ashley Williams from Mass Effect. Uh huh. Um. I, I could have said, oh, looks like a uh, shepherd chose Caden. The worst choice possible. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think go I think not going with people with people with a voice actor background. I think that was actually the smart move to make. In a way, it is because you know when voice actors have gotten used to a certain tone and cadence when it comes to playing characters, which. For things like anime, fan frickin' fantastic, works great. Mm -hmm. But for something like this, might be a little more difficult. And the voice actors they did get were people who have done more a lot more American <laughs> voice acting, which is usually it's not a dub per se; it's just voice acting. Yeah, and you know, the big reason that I say that is if they had if they had got if they had brought if they had gotten say Steve Blum for one for one of the for one of the primary cast members. You would not be able to unhear Steve Blum in of, in other roles and it would and it would distract you. It's the reason I said hi Yuri when we first heard Milo speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He totally did. And I remember I remember seeing a similar story when it came to the casting of Dark City because the producer was get was get was suggesting more well-known roles and the director wanted to go with somebody who was lesser known because in order to reinforce the idea that this was a blank slate individual uh, i think the same thing also i think the same thing also happened when it came to the casting of star the casting of the original star wars lucas intentionally wanted lesser known names because he didn't want to distract people This ain't that kind of movie, kid. Gr that story never gets old. Yeah, Grant, granted, in one instance, he just happened to luck into somebody who was the, who was who was there on the pretense of working carpentry. That being Harrison Ford. Because <laughs> they thought they thought it because there, there was the mindset of hey, I can hey, I can work on carpentry and then use that to sneak my way into. Into do into into doing the into being part of the casting call. Yep. 
but I felt that I felt that was something that we that we should take into account before we get into the final part of it. But with that said, I think it's time for us to render our final judgments. All right. Okay. So, amongst us, we have deliberated expansively on this arcane, the story of the of League of Legends in Piltover and Zaun. In that case, I start with you, Monk. Your verdict, be it weeb or scrub. Arcane as a game tie-in had a lot against it. Even with, even with the name of the IP and the budget, we've been through this dance before. Video game, tie, video game tie-ins do not have the best track record. However, this manages to avoid it by not acting like a video game tie-in, but instead acting like a story in and of itself. Which is the way these things should be done, and rarely are. There's a reason why Gungrave is my standard bearer for this kind of thing. In addition to that, it having a visual and auditory identity that you're not going to confuse with other works. As well as, as well as the fact that you have a set of characters who you are who are going to be connect are going to be connectable on all sides of the occasion and being able to balance essentially two types of stories simultaneously, which is a ve- which is a very difficult thing to do. We've seen we've seen how people we've seen how certain people like say George Martin um, can't seem to balance their own character cast, which is why he probably insists on killing them. Or <laughs> or um or Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross think that introducing more characters is is a substitute for character development. But in here the the plates are properly spun. And I don't even have to break out sword dance. <laughs> so with all that in mind, for me, I vote weeb. All right. The monk himself votes this as a weeb production. Moving on to you, Brother Matty, since you say you have work in the morning. Be it weeb or scrub. Yeah, you guys didn't get the message there. Um, I'm totally kidding, of course. Uh, this show... Get, you, it'll be one of two things. And it's either going to attract you as, oh, I heard about this League of Legends thing. It's going to be fine. Well, will this be good? And if it does, you'll be treated with with a show that, that, that gives you a lot of lore, gives you the idea of what's going on, but may leave you empty at the ending. But if you consider it with all the dominoes and all that stuff, you understand that, you know what? It works so well as a tragedy. And if you're if you're a, a fan of uh, Romeo and Juliet, but obviously for different reasons, you're gonna why you're, if you like sh- tragedies, sh- Shakespearean or otherwise, you're gonna love this show. It's an absolute weeb, 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 weeb. All right, brother Matty votes arcane as weeb as well. Brother Shades, render your verdict. Indeed. Now, as Monk pointed out. Adaptations like this have become a big problem because of how often they make the same exact mistake. More often than not, the bigger mistake is they try to adapt the story of the original, which this actually had the fortunate uh, circumstance of not having an original story to adapt. It had to make up its own. And that ended up being in its favor because it was able to tell a complete story with nothing tying to, nothing holding it down, nothing to restrict it. As long as it fit within the world that they had created for League of Legends and the other Rune Terra space games, they were good. And because of that, they were free to really expand on what they had created. And with great, uh, with amazing animation that matched that of League of Legends' art style, killer soundtrack, and a story that was engaging from moment one to mo- to the final one. From the first moment to the last, everything about this series really deserves the praise it got. Normally, when I see a show get this hyped, I'm sus, and I'm not hitting the fucking button. Mm. <laughs> but, I get suspect every time I see a show get overhyped. But in this case, 
The hype was real, ladies and gentlemen. I could not get enough of this show, and I was looking forward to the next week where we would watch the next episodes and keep going. And I guarantee, even if you know nothing about League of Legends, you can get into this show, watch it from beginning to end, understand exactly what's going on, and get engaged every bit of the way. Rest assured, folks, that is a very difficult thing to do for an adaptation, and this one knocked it out of the park. So let's... I declare Arcane to be weeb! Three for three amongst our brothers here in the parliament. As for myself, the idea of expanding upon the tidbits, the morsels that had been given in League of Legends was always an enticing one. I didn't like the game, but the characters, the art style, the sound, it was all very engaging, and I had always wished there was another way to consume it. And Riot, apparently, has in recent years been listening to that wish from beyond the grave, as I shortly put it to rest after giving up on League entirely. The fact that they are creating other games in the Runeterra space was a good start. But this, expanding upon the lore of some of their most iconic early characters, in including champions that I know weren't talked about nearly as much as other champions, you, you would hear a lot about Vi and Jinx and Caitlyn, but you wouldn't hear as much about Jace or Heimerdinger, Victor, etc. The, well, Heimerdinger was the, the nerf Heimerdinger meme for a little while, but that's neither here nor there within the wider space. That combined with the unique visual style that is absolutely a match for the game, as Shades and all of us have pointed out, the in-depth, and we do mean in-depth, audio identity. The fact that not only with the banger backing tracks from groups like Imagine Dragons, but even the OST tracks that are just there for atmosphere all accentuate and uh, hyper... They, they, they build the hype. They build the hype. That's the best way to put it. And then finally... A little touch that I always like to see in animation anytime. Um, I call it the getter effect for some obvious reasons. <laughs> when they when they go from their full animation into a single colored background with rough drawn features, like when they did when she was firing fish bones at the uh, at the council, how it was all blue and white and all of a sudden the rocket launcher and everything was more rough sketches and drawn parts than an actual fleshed out CG. Which is something you tend to see during like the, the shine spark and getter, which is why I call it the getter effect. That right there is, that's a, that's a chef's kiss type animation uh, technique when used properly. And holy fucking shit was it used properly. There's, there's no contest. It's weeb. It's all weeb. Even if it's Western, this is as weeb as it gets. <laughs> Thus, for and nothing, the Parliament of Geeks declares Arcane, a League of Legends story, to be weeb. Boys, uh, we, we, we got a problem here. <laughs> problem? Uh, yeah, how many episodes have we done now? Well, this is what, what our fourth, third, no, third episode. Yeah, yeah, and all, and each of them have been unanimous for we, but um, in my in my defense in my defense for that, um, I've always I've always felt that the subject matter should be more important than the than the final score, if only if only because I I have a I have a very rocky relationship with 10 point scoring methods in games even though i used it in my early in my early days as a, as a reviewer until i re until i realized that that was going to create problems and i shifted over to the tier based system i've been using to to this day however i do understand where you're where you're coming from on that and um while some people will not like it including myself i do have a plan in regards to that issue. For those worried, it's like it's like Monster Garage. Oh yeah, all most of them are successes. 
and then the hearse comes around. <laughs> there's because also the fact I know that, some of you need to watch Monster Garage. There's also the fact that I'm generally not I I'm generally not a fan of the idea of intentionally putting out, putting other people through bad works, especially when what we try and do here on both on both Monastery Live, Geek Watch, and the Parliament is show is showcase the good that admit, that people may be missing out on. Very true, very true, and that and that's why it, it's it's I've enjoyed this so far. But let's be honest, we have the, the whole point of the Scrubs is they need to be a learning lesson. We need to point out the things that could have been done better and showcase the bad so that we can appreciate the good all that much more. Which is what, which I can guarantee you that there is one that is coming that will be used as a teaching tool. <laughs> I know what it is and I'm, I'm, I'm honestly looking forward to this one. Especially Fair since rod, you, child. You and you and me, especially since I'm going to have a unique perspective on that one when the time comes. Oh yes. I mean, I realize that's redundant given that given that I'm the captain of the ship, but I don't say that with hyperbole for the next one. Oh no 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 no! I can assure you, folks. I, I as so as as I know exactly which one we're referring to. Yeah. He does have a unique perspective, and that's going to make this all the more interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's for another day. Yes. Yeah. So until, um, but I welcome what you all what you all have thought on the matter. Feel free to yell at me in the comments. I always I always welcome I always welcome debate. Um, a a healthy spirited debate. We are not some toxic positivity group who who wants who wants everyone to play nice. No. If you're no, if you're gonna, if people are gonna have a fight, if people are gonna have a fight, at least do, at least do so politely. We may put you in the box for two minutes if you if you end up get if you end up getting a little too rough, but that's how these work. And there's my hockey joke for the night. <laughs> Yay! And of course, and of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time to vent to venture through our ins our insanity, and we'll be back. In a few, in a few weeks, with another with another venture into the men, into the many works that are due for judgment here in the Parliament. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>